Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. We will call the uh, regular meeting of the Kansas City Public School Board of Directors for January 26, 2022 to order. All right, June Lee, please call the roll. Mr. Abarca? Present. Ms. Buckner? Present. Ms. Cortez? Here. Ms. Ford? Here. Dr. Jones? Present. Ms. Wolfsey? Here. Mr. Hogan? Here. Thank you, June. Well, good evening, everyone, and happy second week after full accreditation. Uh, I'm, I'm still riding on a high, as we, I think we should be for a little while, at least. Um, is, are there changes to the agenda as stated? All right, well, the, the agenda is approved then. June, will you take us through a review of the old action items, please? So I have two outstanding. Um, the average testing rate per week, uh, that would be added. I believe that's being added to this week's Friday update. And then what is the district doing to mitigate the stress levels of staff and students? And that's being added. Has that been added, Ms. Dr. Wolfsey? Or, I'm sorry, Dr. Wolfsey. Dr. Woodley. It was last Friday. Sorry about that. Thank you. I like how uh, Ms. Wolsey got promoted um, in, in that whole conversation. So I, I think just a clarification on your first action item, though, uh, June, it's actually uh, it's the average testing positivity rate is what we're looking for. So I don't think I've seen that one come through. So we'll just track on that for the next board meeting. Thank you, ma'am. All right, well, we'll move right into uh, public comment. So I'll call Miss Angie Lyle to the podium. Miss Lyle, thank you for being here as always. And you'll have three minutes. No, the mic does not appear to be on. Yeah, why are we not using it? How about now? Is that good? Awesome. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Bedell, KCPS board, uh, for the opportunity to make this presentation tonight on behalf of the district advisory committee. It's my public comment. <laughs> um, and while I've said it many times before, I'll say it again, congratulations to you and our past board members for all of your hard work to help us achieve accreditation. My name is Angie Lyle. I'm the parent at Lincoln College Prep, a parent at Lincoln College Prep, and I serve as the current DAC executive board chair since my last report. In November, the DAC held its third meeting, um, which was last week on January 18th, and we had about 39 attendees. Uh, 25 of them were uh, visitors, 14 were staff and presenters. We also had the opportunity to hear from the board chair, Mr. Nate Hogan, who spoke about Blueprint 2030 and also had an update from Dr. Bedell regarding accreditation and COVID-19 protocols. As always, we really appreciate having that representation at our meetings. Our guest speaker was Christy Yamuaka, uh, the Positive Coaching Alliance, who spoke with, uh, importance, uh, to the importance of positive coaching and youth sports. We have since put her in touch with our partners in education liaison, Camila Alvarez, to see how we can bring the positive coaching programs to KCPS. We are seeking board support for that. We also reached uh, out to organizers of the Student Leadership Conference that's being planned by students for students so that we can support them. Our support may include financial donation, but will also include professional leads for conference speakers. We're excited about that. I was personally pleased to join the Equity Steering Committee meeting last, uh, I guess that was this week, and look forward to digging deeper into our district policies to find ways to bring them into alignment with our equity goals. I was also pleased to learn about the Student Equity Action Committee that was being formed in the leadership of Marquise Hall to give our future student leaders a voice. We're currently working to help get the word out to parent organizations to invite the Blueprint 2030 team into schools who regularly have meetings, but there are still schools without parent representation, and we'd ask the board to help us um, make that happen. So we are uh, working with Courtney uh, to move forward on a plan to reach out to those schools to get parents to see if we can help them establish groups. Finally, we'd like to address the overall parent concerns regarding athletics. At KCPS, there was no centralized place for parents to get information about sports in their school, including meeting notices or minutes of past meetings and dates for all athletic events. As an example, the LCPA teacher, Kevin Baer, sends out a biweekly district newsletter. However, you have to be on his email contact list in order to receive the information, which is much harder for parents that are at other schools. 
There are several coaching vacancies that are reoccurring almost every year in attempts to hire quality coaches that are a great fit for kids. KCPS and the community, the district should engage in more robust approach that gives an opportunity for stakeholders to participate in the hiring process. This might look like open communication strategy with parents, perhaps an email to let them know what steps they may or may not be able to take in picking a new coach or an administrator, better engagement with the athletics director and staff, or even using social media to get parents' feedback and recommendations, because they're already doing that amongst themselves. Our board suggests that parents also need to more direct plan of action that they can follow when they feel their voice isn't being heard by the administration whom they are supposed to be working with. So we want uh, what's best for the kids, KCPS and its community, even if that means shaking some things a little throughout the district, as one parent had stated, change ignored is change denied. So um, our next DAC meeting will be held virtually March 16th at 6 p.m. Our final DAC meeting is in May. That's only two more meetings this year. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Lyle, appreciate yes, it. We will call Mr. Tom Love to the podium. Always good to see you, sir, welcome. Not used to wearing that mask. I've been really fortunate since I had COVID over a year ago. Um, <clears throat> tonight I am here to ask the board a question, and that question is, are we complying with all the Title I rules and regulations for the state of Missouri? And <clears throat> I've been trying to find the answer to that through going through the uh, attorney for the district, and I'm kind of getting a roadblock. And the reason it's really important is we need, and our children here in this district desperately need, literacy labs. They're supposed to, <coughs> they're supposed to have, if, if we utilize the same literacy labs that take place in Olathe's Title I schools, the students, the bottom 20% of students would get 500 hours of tutoring before they entered third grade from a master's degree reading specialist in para in a small group tutoring session. <coughs> and another 20% would get about a year's worth of tutoring. When I started here coming to these school board meetings, the students were getting zero, absolutely no help, no, no reading specialist in any of the elementary schools. They only had them at the high school level. You know, St. Louis has the same issue. No literacy, they didn't have any reading specialist in their elementary schools when I checked on it when it, we went through the literacy law last year. There's no oversight. It's really, really sad. But the laws are in place, the funding's there, but we need, we need the board members to uh, really dig in and find out about the Title I rules and regs. If you do that and you look at successful districts, and I'm talking world-class successful districts, you can go right across State Line Road into three of the top 25 districts in the entire United States if you're 20,000 students or more, large districts, they're right across the street. Why aren't people looking? If it was a basketball team, if it was KU, and they were you know, up at the national championship rankings year after year after year, up in the running, you'd go see what the coach is doing. We need to go copy what's proven to be successful. It's utilized in other countries in the world. The research was here in the United States. We've got to stop just looking uh, for some sort of magic formula. The formula has already been discovered and it's, being a, it's been applied for decades and we need to get it here. These children, when 30% of the students were going into fourth grade at first grade level or below, they, they didn't get the reading help. One out of six have dyslexia. That's what 30 to 40% of the inmates are in prison. They have dyslexia. They need specialized help every day for three years. And it's, the money's all there. The rules are in place. The laws are supposed to take place. The rules are part of the laws. And we can do it if you ask for it. I may have to go to the state again on this. I don't want to because I want you guys to do it. This, is a, this district is a turnaround example for the country potentially. And you can do it. Just ask the question, demand some answers, and watch it happen. These children have the incredible potential. If you don't believe it, look at Lincoln. All right, Mr. Love, you've had your three minutes. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. it.
All right, we'll move on to our final um, speaker for public comment, which is Mr. Michael uh, Given, who I do not see. So, nope, is he online? Okay, well then that concludes public comment. So we'll move into the superintendent report, and maybe if you're okay with it, Dr. Bedell, I just kinda wanna set this up a little bit. Um, so we've, you know, the board has been, uh, well, let me back up. The district has been doing a lot of engagement around Blueprint 2030, and there's been this so, sort of notion, and certainly the star picked up on it, which is that Blueprint 2030 is all about facilities. It is a facility plan, and the central focus of that plan is to close schools. Um, nothing could be more inaccurate, and so we wanted to present an opportunity for administration to come forward and really dive deep into the academic vision, because really Blueprint 2030 and Dr. Collier will talk about this in her presentation, is really about academic achievement and then the student experience. And so we're gonna have two presentations, one around academic vision and then one around community engagement. Um, and uh, that's what the, the superintendent report will be, or will consist of tonight. So Dr. Bedell, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm trying to figure out if I want, let me just go with my uh, notes that I have first and then I'll um, in with a conversation that I had with the parent today at the Newcomer International uh, Welcome Center that we have. And then we'll bring up our two presenters. So for the community, just to make sure that we're providing some context, uh, we've completed the first two phases of Blueprint 2030 planning processes, uh, the planning process. Beginning in 2019, we embarked upon phase one, an assessment of where we are this was a culmination of internal and external reports, which provided a critical examination of our school district. It included reports such as the system analysis, school reviews, and market research studies. We heard from KCPS students, families, and staff by means of surveys and focus groups to give us an understanding of their perceptions and experiences within our schools. After a brief pause due to the COVID-19 pandemic, in spring 2021, we moved into phase two, an exercise in determining where we want to be. We've been able to ask folks to imagine, to dream big about the future of KCPS. We surveyed, talked to students, had lunch with staff, conducted focus groups with leaders in the community, all to determine our collective vision for the future of this school district. This bright, exciting future for KCPS all starts with what happens in the classroom. Tonight, Dr. Collier will share the draft academic vision uh, that will be fundamental to enhancing this school district. It is not my vision or her vision, it is our vision. This vision is the vision of our community. The academic components you will hear tonight are a direct result of phases one and two of Blueprint 2030. That's why we are considering this now and not six months ago. We needed time for all of those surveys, all of those conversations to come to fruition so that we could triangulate everything that we heard from our students, family, staff, and community. In addition to the academic vision, Tonight, we will provide the Board of Directors and our community with a comprehensive review of Blueprint 2030 engagement to date and plans for future engagement strategies. This will include ensuring that all voices are heard and continue to help us shape this plan as we move into phase three, scenarios and options. We know that when we get into phase three, this is where a lot of co conversations around school configuration, what feeder patterns look like, uh, what should we as a school system, how we should operate in terms of size of schools and operation. And we know that that's very important. So we're looking forward to continuing to engage you all in this process. And there's a piece here that I've often said to everybody, just like when we went through the strategic planning process, we did not come in with a full baked plan around what we wanted to do. I knew what I wanted to see happen, 
But a lot of those things morphed and they changed as we engaged the community when we went through our strategic planning process. So what you will hear today is the foundation for where we want to go as a school district, and maybe it changes. Maybe 20% of it changes, maybe 10% of it changes as we continue to engage. But what we do believe is that there won't be significant change to it because this is what we've heard from our community around what they want to see this district do as we continue to educate kids. Today, I had an opportunity to speak with two parents, and both of these parents showed up to the two town halls that we had, uh, one at Northeast Middle School and the other at Southeast High School. And when I spoke with one of the parents today, one of the things that he shared with me was, was that we really do need to be bold. He is a fifth grader at Carver, and he talked about the mere fact that we're antiquated. Everything that I've been talking about, that we have to become much more flexible, much more agile as a school district. And everything that he went through on his list today, I had to say to him in front of an interpreter, I fully agree with you. This is what we're trying to do. This is what Blueprint 2030 is. It gives us an opportunity to dismantle, redesign, and build out a system that we think will be much more responsive to the student population that we serve in the community that we serve. But what I did leave him with is, the question is, this is what you want, and I agree with you, how far are we willing to go as a community to get to where we want? Do we have the appetite to go through a lot of the pain that is gonna require us to go through and how we change the way that we see schooling as it is currently designed and where we want it to be in the future. So tonight, you know, I'm excited. I think that we have a great opportunity to roll out to you where we're heading. And Dr. Collier, along with the work that she's done in collaboration with a number of central office employees, building principals, and then the engagement uh, externally, we believe we have what it is we need to do. Now it's a matter of what do we have to give up in order to be able to execute on this plan? And so, Dr. Collier, at this time, I'll bring you up to the podium. Thank you, Dr. Bedell. Good evening, all. Dr. Bedell, Board Chair Hogan, board members, um, our executive leadership team, uh, students, staff, families, community. Um, this evening, I have the privilege of presenting the Blueprint 2030 Academic Vision. And as Dr. Bedell said, this is a shared vision, and it's um, this product is a is, was a shared work. And so I want to just acknowledge um, our team of leader, our leadership team, for really working hard to prepare this, to really digging into the research, and then also our principals, our teachers, and students who also contributed to this plan. So the question is, what is Blueprint 2030? Dr. Bedell actually just described it. And so it's really all about, as it says, increasing student achievement and then enhancing our student experience. So when we look at this timeline, you can see that there are six um, phases. And right now, we are at the conclusion of phase two, where we have gathered um, data from stakeholders, where we've researched and we've really thought and planned about where is it that we actually want to be as a school system. Through this process, we have developed um, or crafted um, a new mission statement. This is what we are proposing, that we're upholding the promise of an equitable educational experience so that Kansas City students thrive socially, emotionally, and academically. I think it skipped ahead. This is, the remote is kind of sticking. Okay. Okay, so where have we been? And of course, th this is just a general overview. There's so much that you can fill in the blanks and say, and we don't have time to do that. But this is just kind of an overview of where we've been since 2000. And so um, there has been a revolving door of leadership. The other evening, Dr. Davis and I were sitting down trying to count the number of superintendents that have been here over these last 22 years. And we counted nine people over the last 22 years since I, at least the time I've been here in this school system. And so what that means is every time the superintendent changed, a new leadership team came in, 
which means there was fluctuating instructional focus and programming. Every time a new leader came, they came with their initiatives. And what that did is it led to staff members to a place of just change fatigue. And many people developed an attitude of, well, this too shall pass. Pretty soon there'll be a new, a new leader, we'll live this out, and then we'll move on to the next thing. And as a result, what we have seen is incremental student progress performance over that time. Um, as we all know that we have oscillated between unaccredited and provisionally unaccredited over those years up until January 11th, 2022, and we are very excited about the obtainment of full accreditation status. So where we are today, um, this is the slide that the State Board used um, as they were sharing out um, the information, um, the news that we would be fully accredited. And what it shows is our MPI progress, our scores over these last about five years. We know in 2020 there was no assessment given due to COVID-19. Uh, however, when you look at these scores, over time, you, you do see a decrease somewhat uh, in the MPI, and a lot of that had to do with the COVID years, but what I want to point to and what the state acknowledged was the growth that was happening for children. And so you can see that over these years, we have, we have either met the expectation around st uh, state, uh, state expectation around student growth, and then we've also exceeded. And so we're really excited about this work that we've done. So it tells us that good work is happening. While I say that, I want to be clear, we acknowledge and we recognize that we have more work to do in, it, in terms of our proficiency and advanced rates for our students, especially when we drill down and look at our subgroups. And so this Blueprint 2030 plan is, is our response to that as we continue to work and make sure that our students are growing from those lower levels, that we actually begin to move students who are reaching those levels of proficiency. So where are we going? Um, I love this quote by Paulo Freire, and it says, education cannot be neutral. It is either an instrument of liberation or an instrument of domestication. And so the academic vision statement that we've crafted around this work, what we want to see is connected, empowered, and liberated every child, every educator, every family, every day. So here's a, a little glimpse of um, where we've been and then where, we've go, where we're going. And I want to state that even when we look at where we've been and where we are, it doesn't mean that this is happening everywhere across the district. There are pockets of excellence and we want to acknowledge that. But predominantly what you have seen in, in our school system is a very teacher-centered approach to the, to the delivery of instruction um, where our educators are primarily the holders of knowledge, the gatekeepers of knowledge. Also where educators are doing all of the cognitive lift and they're leading in the learning and students are sitting back passively receiving in the learning process and we know that the best learning happens when students are engaged and leading. So where we're going now is to a more progressive approach that's student centered in our delivery. It's more active and hands on. Um, students are uh, able to collaborate where they can learn with and through other students. It's more uh, experiential for them and it's tied to real world experiences so it makes the learning relevant for them. Is something that they want to engage in, they find joy in. And then those learning experiences are not just in the classroom, but they extend beyond the four walls of school and into the community and the world. Here's just a, a composite list of some of the uh, Blueprint 2030 academic components. I'm not gonna read all of these. I'll cover some of these in the presentation, but I just wanted to provide this. The other thing I wanna say is that throughout this presentation, because it's so dense, it's a lot here, I have attached um, links to articles. So if you're wanting more information, you can, you can quickly access those articles and read, read up on what some of these items are. I just wanna make sure that our, our full community is able to get an understanding of what this academic plan consists of. So first, looking at um, a portrait of, the, of our students in 2030, what we did is we worked and we talked about um, what is it that we want to see in our students in 2030. And there are so many things that we want to see. We could have included a lot here. But these are the, the, the items that really came forth for us. And number one is voice. We want our students to develop voice and a sense of agency um, in our school system and in their classrooms and in their schools where they are actually leading in their learning. They have opportunities to make decisions about their learning. They are goal, goal set. 
setting. Those are things that we want to see in our students. And then we want to make sure that as educators, we're actually listening to our students and responding to what it is that matters most to them. We also want to ensure that our students are globally competent. And we believe that through rigorous instruction, access to world language, to the fine arts, to project-based learning, all of these are, are skills, are um, avenues or tools that will help our students develop skills to be globally competent. A glimpse or a portrait of our educator, once again, you see voice at the top, and we think that it's really important also that our educators have voice. Um, our school-based educators in particular, they are our boots on the ground, and they are, our, are the folks in the district that have the most immediate and sustained contact with children. So they know, they have a lot of valuable insight around how students learn, what students' needs are, and so it's gonna be very important that we ensure that they are included in decision-making. Also, they understand what their needs are and how we can best support them. So we want our educators to be empowered and have voice as well. And then expectations. This is a critical mandate if we really want to advance student learning. Our teachers, our educators must come with high expectations for our students. We know that many of our students come with a variety of experiences, some of them um, some major traumas and some challenges. However, we do not want that to be inhibitor to our students' learning. We don't want to coddle our students. We want to support them, but we know that our students, regardless of their background, their race, their language, whatever, their, their um, social economic status, we know that they can meet high expectations and they can perform at high levels. And that is, will be the district-wide expectation as we move forward. And then a glimpse of our family. We felt like it was important to include family in the plan because we want our families to be a really um, uh, integral part of this educational process. And so we know a lot of shifting has to happen around how we view parents and caregivers and family members. Once again, voice is important. We want our parents um, to feel valued, to feel heard, and to really feel like they are an authentic part of the decision-making process in our school system. And then that partners in education is important. We want to call them partners because we want to demonstrate on every level that, that the information that they bring is not just a one-sided communication. We're hearing from them and we're under understanding their needs and that we're incorporating their voice in those decisions that we are making regarding their students learning and the opportunities that are made available to students in this district. So moving now into our district-wide teaching approach. And you hear, I wanted to provide some of the key thought leaders for this work. Um, this particular approach is very important, it's very relevant. It was designed by educators and scholars of color, which I think is very important, but it was also designed specifically for culturally and linguistically diverse students, and that is culturally responsive teaching, and this is why we chose this. So culturally responsive teaching, what is it? Um, there are so many um, definitions out there, but this is one of the definitions that I really liked because it really tied in making those connections um, with our students' culture, bringing that culture into in their language and their life experiences into the classroom, and helping teachers understand how do they leverage that in the classroom um, so that students can engage with new content and make meaning and make sense of that new content, content in ways that they are able to conceptualize that new learning. And so when we engage in culturally responsive teaching, our students will be able to access rigorous curriculum and develop the higher level academic skills. So why culturally responsive teaching? I've kind of answered it already, but here I wanted to show some of our student demographics so you could clearly see why culturally responsive teaching is would be very important to us as we move forward. And then I wanted to just quickly um, acknowledge and tap into that um, funds of knowledge by Luis Mall. He is a professor. Um, that has done a lot of study around cultural responsiveness. Um, and that funds of knowledge is the understanding that our students are coming with, with valuable knowledge and information that we can use in the classroom. Sometimes when students come, uh, some educators, and it's not intentional, they don't view what students are bringing as valuable because it doesn't appear to be academic. Also, many educators are teaching through their own cultural lens, and they understand what's important to them as an educator, but they don't always think about what is important or valuable to the student, which is why we have to understand that our students are coming with this funds of knowledge, this information that we can use. When we, when we tell them to leave all of that at the door, 
we prohibit their ability to learn and to progress. So we have to make sure that all of our, our teachers, our educators, and I wanna say this is not just for teachers. You'll notice I use educator a lot throughout the presentation because I don't want it to, to seem like all of this is falling on the teacher. We've got to be a culturally responsive school system. We have to demonstrate that even here at the central office level. We have to make sure that our curriculum supports this. We have to make sure our professional development supports this so that our teachers can actually do this in the classroom. This is all of our responsibility to be culturally responsive. So when we're engaging with cultural responsiveness, um, we're gonna be using the Ready for Rigor framework, and, it, and it's really based on four interdependent um, key areas for teachers. And the, the first area is around awareness, and that's, to make it simple and quick, is really about educators first understanding their own culture, recognizing their culture, and also their own social political context and positioning. Are they coming to the classroom with privilege? And how is that impacting the way they deliver instruction and the way they interact with students? Also understanding our students' culture and their social political context so that we make learning relevant for them. The second part is the learning partnership. And this is really about reimagining that teacher-student uh, relationship and really looking at uh, making sure that that relationship is more um, a learning partnership where students, once again, are taking lead in that learning. Um, this is also the place where the teacher acknowledges the social emotional stress and trauma that students experience when they are met with uh, microaggressions and stereotype threats. Those are the things that cause students to shut down and they no longer have trust, and when that happens, they're unable to learn. And so it's important that our educators understand that as well as they're building that learning partnership. Then moving into information processing, that is really looking more at getting into the instructional practice. How does this impact instructional practice? And there's several things that have to happen. One, students must engage in rigorous content, grade level content. Even if they are performing below grade level, they have to have access to that grade level rigorous content and they have to have the supports to scaffold up. If they don't do that, they never have an opportunity to engage in what is called productive struggle. They have to do that to build that intellective capacity. Also, this is where the teacher has to bring in those cultural metaphors and the um, examples that help students understand and make meaning of the new learning that they're being introduced to. And then this is also where those uh, cognitive routines and those habits of mind are developed so that students begin to practice those and they become independent learners. They don't need the teacher to help them. They don't need the teacher to be a crutch anymore. They're able to do that. They're able to apply these practices in new learning environments. So many of us have seen, I didn't mean to turn, many of us have seen that level of culture tree. I'm not gonna talk a lot about it because I think we've seen it a thousand times. We probably have seen the iceberg. Um, but, but the main thing about this is that we've had to get beyond just the surface culture the shallow culture, and those are things that primarily show up in most schools. We've got to get to that deep culture if we really want to accelerate student learning. And that gets into really their core beliefs, their values, cultural archetypes, which I'm not going to talk about right now because I know it's a lot, and then those mental models. But um, once again, I have a lot of links in here that will lead you to uh, places where you can read more about this. But this is really important as we um, prepare to really dive deeply into culturally responsive teaching. So this district-wide teaching approach, also, also we're looking at critical pedagogy. This is important as well, especially when you go back and look at our student demographics. So those are some of the key thought leaders there in Paulo Freire, um, he, he did the work around a culture of, of oppression, wrote a book on it, but it's, it's, this um, approach is really all about um, empowering and liberating those who have been historically marginalized and oppressed. And it's about helping those people find voice and impact change for themselves and others. So this, um, what is critical pedagogy? I kind of explained it, but if I go a little further, um, it's, it's helping students to identify those inequities, those injustices around in their community, their home, their neighborhood, in the school, 
is helping them to identify that and then helping them develop the tools to have voice and agency around galvanizing support um, and learning how to amplify their voice to be able to speak truth to power until they're in a position to speak power to power. They can speak truth to power to start affecting some real change around them. They don't have to wait until they're adults. They can do that now and if we want them to do it as adults, we need to provide the space and the place for them to be able to practice this as young people. Number one, they have the right and the responsibility to do that. Their voices are valuable, and they need to know they have a voice, it's valuable, and they need to lift it, they need to raise it up to be able to uh, affect positive, meaningful change for themselves, but also for those who are around them. So why critical pedagogy? I kind of explained it already, but it talks about social justice identity, understanding what is it that matters to them around these social justice issues? What is their position on that? How do I amplify my voice? What are the ways to go about doing that when I see things that are inequitable or things, if I see injustice, how do I go about um, addressing these things and confronting these things? And then also the, the space for them to challenge the status quo. Once again, even if it's in the school or the classroom, we want our students to develop these skills. So engaging critical pedagogy, the places where you'll see it show up is, is in the advisory curriculum in particular for our secondary students. As they meet weekly or twice a week, um, they will be engaging in uh, critical pedagogy as well as some of the other things that are listed there. It's going to be embedded in our learning projects for K-12. Um, we're also gonna be working to develop a framework around exercising voice and agency because some people may not understand what that looks like. And we wanna make sure that our students are doing that constructively. So we're gonna have a framework that we create um, you heard this evening about the Student Equity Action Committee. Um, once again, we have a steering committee that is comprised of staff and family and community, but we don't have students currently on that committee. And we want to give them a space to be able to address equity issues in our school system. And then student councils, we have them currently in some buildings, but not all. And we want, we want all of our schools to have active student councils so students are actively leading and understand what leadership looks like. Once again, so when they leave these walls, they know how to lead. They know how to use their voice. So the district-wide teaching approach, again, project-based learning. And why this is important, I guess I'm going to talk about why later, but this is really about students learning by doing, moving away from, um, from direct instruction, from a lot of lecturing, from a lot of seat work, things that are not interesting to kids. When we talk about wanting kids, to, wanting kids to be engaged and finding joy in their learning, they need to be active. They need to be um, trying to solve issues, issues that matter to them, real world issues around them. Sometimes when, when uh, learning is not relevant, they don't understand why it's important, they won't engage. But if they can understand how this affects me, my community, the larger world, then they will be able to engage and they will want to do this. And teachers don't have to work so hard to engage them. But this also impacts our teachers' practice. Many teachers don't enjoy working in isolation. This gives them an opportunity to work together with and learning with and through one another. So I kind of explained already why project-based learning, but here are just a, a few examples, the authentic engagement, connecting that learning to real world situations, but also I wanna to point to the correlates um, to student achievement, and, and in, in particular students um, in high poverty communities. There's a lot of research that shows that when project-based learning is done well, when it's implemented well, students um, from every background perform at high levels. And so this is what we want to see for our students. Um, here are some essential elements. I'm not gonna go through, through all of these. I just wanna really point to that 21st century skills. These are the skills that we want our students to obtain and what many employers are looking for. So this gives us the opportunity to develop this in our students. And then the project-based learning as interdisciplinary approach. We know that real life is not compartmentalized, is not disconnected, and neither should be learning. Learning should be um, showing the connection between all these pieces and making it realistic for students so they understand why they're learning and they can make sense of that learning. And so that's something that we'll be focusing on, making sure that, it, that that approach is also interdisciplinary. And then that district-wide literacy and mathematics focus. When we go back and, and look at our data, we know that we have to develop a laser focus on our literacy and mathematics. Um, and so we have to be very intentional about that. So our team has been planning some things, um, some, some uh, strategies and ways that we can enhance the literacy focus. 
and so as you, and literacy and math focus, and so some of the things is teaching reading in the content area. I won't go through all of these, but I'm just really excited because some of our high schools have already started this. So what this means is that the ELA teacher or the reading teacher is not the only person in the building responsible for reading. It doesn't matter what your content area is, you can teach reading, and so we're making sure that those teachers are learning the strategies that they need to help um, our students be proficient readers. Um, we're also gonna be uh, developing a district-wide reading campaign. We believe it's important to develop a culture of reading, a love for reading, and for that to be demonstrated everywhere. So everywhere our students turn, they see people um, talking about reading, they're encouraging reading, they are reading. And so we want this to be something our families are involved in. There's a place for families in this. Also the community, when they go into businesses, maybe they can be rewarded for reading so many books. When they go into their churches, they're hearing about reading. Everywhere they go, people are talking about reading and emphasizing the importance of reading. And we just establish that in, as a culture in our district. And then the endorsements that we want for, for teachers around reading and ESL. And we have a team of people that are now working on, on that. How, do we, um, how are we able to bring a program like that to our district so that our teachers can get those endorsements so that they're better, better equipped to address the reading needs of all of our students. And then the peer mentoring is, is really our, like our high school students, our older students, pairing up with some of the younger students and modeling reading and allowing the young children to read to them. On the mathematics side, we're gonna be focusing on vocabulary um, that will help support mathematical comprehension so students can understand those word problems. Do they first of all understand the vocabulary? If not, they're gonna have a difficulty solving the math problem if they're not really understanding what the words are. So we're gonna make sure that we really focus once again on that academic vocabulary. Um, there will be professional learning around utilizing the five strands of mathematical proficiency. Um, our element, elementary teachers as well, we want to make sure that they receive a mathematics endorsement so they are taught how to teach math. Many element, elementary teachers, um, that is not their area of focus um, and, or area where they're strong. That in science, uh, most elementary teachers are more geared toward the um, uh, ELA and uh, social studies, but not so much mathematics and science. And so we want to help um, equip our teachers so that they can help our students better understand those foundational skills in math. And then once again, the peer mathematics mentoring, where our high school students are coming. And I didn't say this is also an opportunity for those high school students to, to earn some community service hours by helping some of the younger children. So the increase of arts in the educational experience, um, there's lots of research that points to the academic uh, benefits of arts and education. Some people have said this is just a glittery extra, it's a side, it is not, it is not. There's a reason why arts is prevalent in many of your top districts, is not by chance. It's because it is important. And think about this, we live, our students are living right here in a thriving arts community. How many of them are actual full participants in this community? Most of them are consumers and they go and observe, but they never actually have an opportunity to be a part, and that's the sad thing. Our students should leave our system being able to fully participate if that is their choice, but we have to make sure that they're equipped with the knowledge and the skills to be able to do that. Also, Increasing world language in our educational experience. Once again, there's tons of research around the academic benefits of that as well. And so once again, we're looking at starting at kindergarten for world language. And I didn't say, um, at one point we talked about third grade for instrumental music, and I think now we've moved down to kindergarten. We believe we found a way to be able to start them earlier. So we're really excited about that. Those two things, music, instrumental music, and world language as early as kindergarten for our children. This is really important, you all, it really is, because many times arts is the pathway into other, into other areas. And I'm gonna talk about it when I get to STEAM, but arts is the way many kids understand how they show up in STEAM. I've been reading a book by Chris Endom, it's blown my mind, and he talks about we have believed this myth about arts that it's not important. We need to understand how powerful the arts are. And if we really wanna see children of color and linguistically diverse students do well in some of these areas, Arts is the way to do it. So I talked about it already, because I was excited. <laughs> I am excited, I love the arts, I do, I, I do. It's, it's one of my passions, and I feel, and I've always felt that, um, that children in urban districts are often deprived of that. 
that is like the first thing we cut. That's not something that we don't focus on and we drill and kill them and, and, and reading and math. And those things are important. And we're going to continue to do that in different ways. But we have to allow to expose them to other things. Once again, sometimes that's the pathway. And Chris Indom talks about the reason why uh, children of color have not done as well in STEM is because arts is a place where they're able to um, express their identity and their creativity. And without that there, they, they have difficulty even locating themselves in science, engineering, technology, and math. They don't know a lot of people who are scientists or engineers. Arts is the pathway in. So I'm really excited about this STEAM. And then I have the course offerings just so you have that information and some research about STEAM on the other side. Our middle school model is really all about career exploration, um, you know, helping our kids dive deeper into career possibilities, um, and then really preparing them for those pathways that they're going to encounter when they um, reach the high school level. And here's some of the course offerings that we have for our middle school students. trying to move on through. And then high school model, competency-based education. I've talked about this before. Um, this is really exciting because it really starts to get into personalized learning for children. And once again, it's removing those and loosening those constraints of time and space. It doesn't mean that it's unstructured learning. Like I've heard people talk about it like it's willy-nilly and kids would do whatever. We have to make sure that there's structure to it, but it's, it allows for more flexibility so we're actually meeting the needs of our children. So that flexible scheduling, uh, different hours, multiple modes of learning. Some of the learning will uh, mirror what you see on a college campus. Some will be in person. Some of it may be online. Some of it be, may be field experience. And then uh, once again, the career pathways in our high school so that they're delving deeper into the pathways that they're actually interested in, following their, their interests and passions, that project-based learning continues, and then those opportunities for internships and uh, job shadowing um, continues at the high school level. I wanted to include in here that we're not moving away from our college and career programming. We're continuing and we're building on this. And this is through our partnership with Prep KC. And so basically it's showing you how college and career programming is happening across our system at every level, beginning at the elementary level, all about exposure. And then in the middle school level, exploration, going a little wider and a little deeper. Then high school level ninth and 10th graders focusing on, on preparation for those pathways as they're doing some job shadowing and interacting with professionals. And then in that 11th and 12th grade year, they're really working to obtain those market value assets. Um, one of the goals that we have as a school system is that by 2025, 75% of our graduates will leave with a market value asset. And by 2030, 100% of them leave with a market value asset. And then uh, pre-kindergarten expansion, I'll just simply say that um, we know that when students have access to quality um, pre-K programming earlier, it better positions them for success in K-12 education. And we would love to be able to expand um, our kindergarten offerings. <coughs> Parents and caregivers' role in the educational process, once again, this is gonna be very important um, because we wanna we want send a message to our parents that we truly, authentically value their voice, not a box to check off, but that we actually really engage them and hear from them and allow them to be a part of the um, educational process, the learning and social emotional aspects of, of schooling. And so we're looking at developing or adopting a culturally responsive family support model and then also looking at establishing a family engagement and empowerment center. And Major Brooks, if you heard him, he's always talked about that one-stop shop for parents. Well, that's really what that is. One of our, and I'm proposing this, you know, this is a dream, uh, one of our mothball buildings or a space that we're not going to use, being a space that's devoted to parents where almost any support that they need is provided there. You know, if they need housing support, it's there. If they're wanting to learn more about um, the curriculum in the district, they can get that support there. If they, they need um, help with basic needs, all of that is there. And so this is something we're working toward, I hope we're going to work toward, um, that I would really love to see come to fruition. And then the implications for school classroom space. We know that if we're going to do all this, there will have to be some changes to our physical environment. We've heard a lot about that already, so I won't spend a lot of time here. But what I do want to say is that distance learning classroom that you see that last at our secondary schools, this is one of our strategies, strategies to try to get ahead of some of our potential um, staffing issues, especially as we say we're expanding um, our world language and we're expanding you know, music offerings and fine arts offerings. Um, we want to make sure that None of our schools, we, ha we have to tell our students, well, we can't offer this course because we don't have a teacher. 
if we're able to have one teacher, that teacher can teach the course at East High School and can be teaching students at Central and Northeast at the same time, and that teacher could possibly rotate so all students have an opportunity for in-person experience. But we don't have to tell kids you can't have a course um, because of staffing, and we know staffing has been an issue and probably in the near future it will continue to be. So we want to plan around that or get ahead of that particular issue. Um, items to consider for smooth implementation. I'm going to talk in just a moment about that implementation. You'll see it on the next slide, how it's going to happen in phases. I, I'm sure this is a lot. It's a lot to even talk about. So in order for us to actually implement this well, we're going to have to phase it in. We can't bring it all in one time as good as it is. It has to come in in phases so that our staff members can handle this and digest it and do it well, and then we'll layer on something else on the next phase. Um, professional development will have to uh, change. And so we're looking at a multi-year PD calendar, and, and we're actually looking at how we can plan out PD, PD for years to come so we clearly know what's going to happen when. Uh, modified calendar, we've talked a lot about that early release or a trimester. We're continuing to, to engage our union around that, but we're looking at modifying our calendar so it better meets our students' needs. The modified curriculum, there's so much there that has to happen. We have to make sure that we have a curriculum that supports culturally responsive teaching, project-based learning, needs of our ELL students, our special education students, and I'm really excited about the collaboration we're doing with our ESL department to infuse more ESL strategies and work into our curriculum so it's not a separate, but it's a part of what we do here in education. And then the assessment grading practices are going to have to change, especially around some of the competency-based learning um, that will happen and how we'll um, grade them and the timing on when those grades go in. And then facility and space, once again, um, will be um, impacted. So here are, are the phases. I won't talk through all of it, but you can see what it is that we plan to do year by year. Um, that right now, this is the initial plan. And so um, you can see that in 27, 28, we actually say evaluation assessment of programming uh, and some adjustments based on that data. But I wanna say that that's not gonna happen just in 27 and 28. We'll be doing that in each phase, really looking at, is this effective what we're doing? What does our data say? What does the research say? What are our students, our parents, our staff members saying? And then if we need to, we'll make tweaks in order to ensure that what we're doing is effective. And so our professional learning for next year, what we're focusing on is a culturally responsive teaching. Um, we're working now to engage Zaretta Hammond. We just heard today that she is available for our teacher institute, and so we're looking forward to bringing her um, to that. We will be doing a district-wide book study because, once again, this cannot just be the teachers. We all have to get on board with this and have a common understanding of what cultural responsive is, responsiveness is. I'm sorry, responsiveness is, and really develop that language around that so we all understand and we can move forward together. And then there are other things that are happening, and I'm not going to read it all to you, but I do want to point out the summer sessions where we are beginning to really focus in on that math and literacy strategies for our teachers. And we will be using ESSER funds to um, help us achieve that this summer. And then we felt like it was important for the key performance indicators, how will we measure whether or not what we're doing is effective. We felt like it was important not just to have it for students' data, but also around our educator data and our families, our parent caregivers, because once again, we want to ensure that we leave no stakeholder group behind, that everybody is truly a part of this educational process. And once again, it's a, it's a different way of doing things, so we have to hold ourselves accountable as we continue to look at these KPIs. Um, the challenges and barriers that we've identified, human capital, um, which we, has been a challenge, uh, time for professional development, which we're still working on as we continue to work closely with our union, and then the funding to, to support the sustainability of this programming over time. How can we continue this um, when ESSER funds are gone? How, how can we make sure that we don't stop doing these things that will be highly effective and uh, impactful for our students? And I just included a glossary of terms because I know I use a lot of words and there's a lot in the presentation that people may not know. Hopefully, once again, I provided links to all of this. So, And I try to not use the more dense uh, scholarly articles that are sometimes <laughs> challenging to read through as I was reading through them. I try to use the ones that can, where you can walk away with an understanding pretty quickly of what each of these items are. All right. All right, so I'll start off by just, first of all, thanking you for your presentation. I know um, we put a lot of work in 
over the last several months of putting this together, getting all of this data, a number of dry runs uh, to make sure that we were ready to go tonight. <clears throat> and what I hope our board and, and community members and folks who come back and view this presentation on our, our, our that will be archived on our website is that you saw a clear connection to what was presented at the very beginning. You saw the profile that we want of a student, the profile that we want in teachers, the profile that we want in how we <coughs> are more inclusive with our parents. And then as you go through the presentation, you could see the connectivity through everything that we want to do that leads us right back to the mission that we talked about, to the academic vision, um, and ultimately us really becoming a powerful school district that, that truly <coughs> embraces the voices of all. And you heard that <coughs> theme emerge over and over and over again because we want to make sure that we are representing the unique voices in this district that are often overlooked. And we will not be deterred in that drive to ensure that this is a school district that represents all and represents all very well. Everybody wins when you do it in the manner that we are looking to propose. So I want to thank you and I do want to say this. We will continue to engage. We think that there are opportunities to learn more from this community and the business sector and many of those other entities. There are some things that I'm certain we haven't thought about or some of our folks that we have engaged with have thought about. And so we will continue to engage at a high level uh, to make sure <laughs> that we get the essence of what this community wants in this vision that we have for sustained accreditation above and beyond and that this is a very highly competitive <laughs> district at the state level, nationally and globally. So that's all I wanted to say. All right, thank you, Dr. Bedell. Dr. Collier, um, great. I, I have some comments and questions, but as always, I'll defer to my colleagues. Who wants to start? Or she crushed it so much that there are zero <laughs> questions. Uh, Ms. Buckner. Uh, Dr. Collier, thank you so much for that. Um, I'm really excited about um, what's to come and all of the work that you all have done. This is amazing. Um, one thing that <clears throat> that we talked about a while ago, I, I don't remember the topic, but we were <laughs> we were discussing uh, project based learning as a um, I think it was a discussion about summer school. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know who, exactly who was up here, but someone named that. Our teachers really didn't like project-based learning. They felt like something, there were like some pinch points with project-based learning. And so, um, you know, my question is, is like, what is the plan for identifying the pinch points or the negative connotations that our teachers have with these new approaches to learning? Mm -hmm. um, because with approaches like, like project-based learning, when we start throwing out these terms, people come in with their own ideas. Mm -hmm. Project-based learning, culturally responsive teaching, really requires a mindset and culture shift. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I I'm just really curious to know, I would hate for culturally responsive teaching to become a buzzword in this district. Mm -hmm. um, so how do we ensure that there is a culture and mindset shift happening along with this plan. Well, I, I think that happens um, um, through our, our learning together um, and then ensuring once again that there is alignment in everything that we're doing. So once again, that curriculum, making sure the curriculum is really designed to support teachers because it is a new way of thinking and so we have to almost put, build in safety nets into the curriculum so we, so we help teachers understand okay, this is what culturally responsiveness is in this particular um, example. And then also the professional development has to be aligned uh, specifically to culturally responsiveness. And then we have to continue having conversations around it. When we do walkthroughs, we have to monitor for it regularly, get feedback on it regularly. And then where we see where we're weak, we have to then come back in and provide additional training and support, and we continue to do that. It can't be a, a one-and-done type of professional development and think that everybody's going to do it well. We have to continue to train year after year. And so one of the things that was not in the phases was that 
that this is layered, it doesn't mean that if it's not named in the next phase that it doesn't continue. We're gonna have to continue to have these conversations around uh, uh, all of these professional um, project-based learning, around the uh, culturally responsive teaching, uh, critical pedagogy. We have to continue to have touch points on that to ensure that we're doing it with fidelity. Let me just tag on to that because <clears throat> You know, we, 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 we have no problem being crystal clear with everybody and being extremely transparent that even when you think about what happened with summer school, it just simply wasn't enough time to properly train <clears throat> people. We, you know, that was something that we wanted to go down that path, but the frustration also came because people felt that they weren't fully equipped. I think when you think about a 19-day or 20-day summer experience, there's not much you're going to be able to get in there in addition to us building out infinite campus. That was a big part of, uh, we just had a lot of things that I think put us in a position where it made those individuals that were running some, that were working summer school feel like I, this is not something I can do. But if the training is done properly, everybody understands the why behind why we're doing it. Um, we think that this will make learning come alive again, right? We tend to lose the liveness in learning when kids move to secondary schools. And I've said this, every district I've worked in, the joy seems to be stripped by the time they get to middle school and high school, but we think that if we do this right, it just reinvigorates and it brings everything to life. And everything really is contingent around consistent, intentional, continuous training. The PD piece is critical. That's the reason why we've been really having deep conversations with our union around how do we make sure that we get the professional development in um, in order to be able to do this at a high level. And can I just add it, something I did not mention? Um, if you notice in the phasing, um, a lot of things may start at the secondary level in one phase and then we move it to the elementary. So for example, you'll see the project-based learning happening with secondary schools sooner. Next year, um, Northeast High School will be piloting a project-based learning model, 3DE, and um, we're getting support from folks that are coming in to help us craft this out. And so as we look at that model, that will help us determine what it is that we need to do differently, what, what are those points that are um, causing pain for teachers in the process as we pilot it, and then we further build it out so that we're not trying to implement all at once and not able to really support and serve our staff appropriately. But I think that's a really good strategy to pilot um, these things. Um, one, uh, one additional like push, you've already named this, is like this has to be a district mm -hmm. approach. Um, I work with teachers every day that are like, you know, we're, we're learning all these things about culturally responsive teaching, mm -hmm. but nutrition services don't really like support mm -hmm. this, right? Yep. Um, so how do we get our student support services, the people who are driving the buses, who are serving our kids' foods, who are cleaning our buildings, um, this has to be a, a culture change. And so um, I know we talked a lot about our, our teachers, but um, is there a plan for ensuring that everybody is looped in? Yes, everyone will be a part of the professional development for culturally responsive teaching. Everyone is expected to be a part of the book study. We're developing uh, what we're calling like champions for cultural responsiveness that will be responsible for helping us train all of our staff. So we're So people in food service, our custodial team, our teachers, bus drivers, I don't know if we can get our bus drivers since they are, if we can, then we, yeah, <laughs> since we contract them out, but, uh, but uh, everybody that's a part of the system, we've already start costing out what that's gonna be to get the books for them, and then we're gonna start mapping out what that professional development should look like for each of those groups, so that it's meaningful, so that people understand what does this look like in the role that I'm serving in? Like, how is this work relevant to me? And I think the board should be a part of that too. Absolutely. So, yeah. We might have you guys help facilitate. <laughs> I disagree. Others? <laughs> Ms. Cortez? So, Dr. Collier, thank you for both the time and the depth. Um, it strikes me that anybody who wants to find something wrong in here will, but what I really hope is that people will find, will recognize that not every component will serve every kid, but the collective of it will find the keys that unlock how we set those expectations high for every kid, yeah. right? Um, but in terms of expectation setting, and, and this really goes to the dialogue that you had with Vince Buckner, um, I would encourage that another piece of the conversation of culture change 
also be in how we think about what feedback means, mm -hmm. right? Because to be successful with this much change really requires more of a coaching mindset, catch them being good, and encourage risk taking. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean risk as a bad thing. I mean right. risk as a good thing, right? Our teachers are going to have to experiment to find mm -hmm. how they do these things effectively in their classroom. Yeah. But I, <coughs> I think that, that, that there might be some component of, of building that culture shift by acknowledging that you know, we, when we talk about dismantling systems, part of the system that we're dismantling is kind of a, 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 is a judgmental mm. sense and more of we're building this for all of us sense. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we may even have to think about just some baseline language change. Yes. Um, in that sense. Yeah, I love that thought about the composite is what's going to help us serve all kids. I, 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 I've thought that or I've thought around that, but you kind of nailed what I was thinking and you said it. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. I appreciate it. So yeah. uh, really quickly, I just because we're on this conversation around culture change, organizational change, mm -hmm. um, all of that, I just want to interject a um, more of a comment than anything else. So I remember 2019, we're having a conversation with uh, Joe Phillips around all of the systems, right? We were doing so much technology transformation inside this organization, it was mind boggling. And that's coming from somebody who's worked with gigantic health systems, right? With 30,000 mm -hmm. people trying to do these massive sort of transformational projects. And I asked about organizational change management and what we were going to do. And the, the answer was very light, right? It was superficial, it wasn't deep. And there are, p there are pr entire practices built around organizational change management that leverages things like I influencers. And you used the word champions earlier to do training. But training is only one tiny slice of how you go shift an organization, right? Mm -hmm. And so thinking about how you identify influencers, the communication plan that's wrapped around this change has to emphasize the importance of, of the coming change and doing things like gamification, right? Making it yeah. interesting and fun for the folks that you're trying to get on board. Um, and then you need to measure adoption as well, right? Because training and adoption are not the same thing. Are people actually doing the things that you're training them to do and are they doing them correctly? So as you guys think about like doing this work, it's really, really important that you start to think about how, I'm guessing here, and so correct me, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm guessing you don't have organizational change management expertise inside the district. That's something I think you should be thinking about is how do we get support to develop a really comp comprehensive plan to roll these changes out so that the entire organization begins to really bring on the, the, they're doing the things that you want them to do and doing them in the right way to support the results that you're ultimately trying to get. Mm -hmm. So it's just something to think about okay. as you guys are going through this because it's going to be a <coughs> significant change. And to your point earlier, Dr. Bedell, like you want this to take hold yeah. um, because at the end of it all is our kids ultimately being able to get what they need out of it. So Mr. Abarca. No, I was just taking notes. I mean, I, I, I agree. I think that sounds like a good plan. I, I think we will need that support to ensure this happens. I mean, it's this is really con consequential work, and we don't want to take it lightly. We want it done well, and we want to see the outcomes um, that we've been waiting, you know, to see with our students. I mean, we've done, like I said, really great work, but um, I, I think that this is really um, going to be impactful and it's done well, and so we will need some support. Um obviously agree with all my colleagues here. I think this has been, to your credit here, one of the most impactful, concise, uh, but still full and robust presentations we've had in a long time. This is well Thank done um, on that end. Um, I, I want to first give some kudos here. I, I saw the, the arts component, obviously, <laughs> and um, I think it's important, as you had kind of uh, alluded to, uh, people turn in their darkest moments to the arts, whether it's movies, mm -hmm. music, and that's not always appreciated in budget seasons. And um, <laughs> I applaud this effort in taking it all the way back to kindergarten. That's, that's amazing. Um, as someone who started as early as sixth grade, I thought um, that was even then. Mm -hmm. So uh, kudos to that. Um, one thing that I would point out that I would love to see here, and, and I'm glad you brought up uh, Frieri. I think that's a, an interesting and very progressively minded scholar uh, to, mm -hmm. to quote. Um, they talk about, um, the workforce component, right? And how sometimes school districts can mm -hmm. be the systems that yep. drive people to poverty, unfortunately. Yep. 
and the reality that I think we need to bring in union trades as uh, a component of that, right? I mean, we talk about mm -hmm. everyone shouldn't go to college um, and, and union trade specifically focus on the workforce component, but also the pay component, right? And being able to mm -hmm. have a livable wage. So I'd love to see specifically and okay. in, in, in hear in some way them somewhat named and some process um, to, to work and, and direct in that way. Um, the other component is, I think you, you'd mentioned you talked to teachers and professional development was an area that I didn't hear you necessarily say they have much input on. So I wanted to ask around, mm -hmm. you know, what input do teachers have around the professional development they have? It seems like this proposal is really in depth, mm -hmm. but is it something that they also proposed outside of, I think, a, a couple panel discussions and your conversations uh, with Dr. Bedell? Um, pr professional <laughs> development, uh, we usually handle the teacher voice around that in, through the um, negotiation process. That's typically where that happens, but we also engage our teachers in some of our other uh, committees like the uh, Deputy Advisory Committee. And one of the things that we're gonna make sure that we, we do, our team is really working this year to engage our staff members around issues that we historically have not, you know, things that we would just decide at this level, we're bringing everything to that teacher advisory. And it's, right now it's just a small group. But I think we can find ways to bring um, professional development and other aspects, components, to our educators so that they have more decision-making power. I'm not sure if that's what you're asking, but yes. We definitely want to do that because that's that's the way we're going to really get people to um, buy in and really you know pick this up and do it. Um, if, if if we're just telling them to do it, they're less likely to do it or to understand why. But I think they need to be a part of this. Um, and one question, just to make sure I understand, and I think for the public's benefit, who obviously are here um, from the media standpoint as well as listening online, these are proposed changes, right? That's correct. This, this that requires some level of community support and stress yep. patience as we navigate this Blueprint 2030 process. So I think to the public's point, um, can, can you tell us how they can access this full report? Because I think this is incredible information as we consider bonds in the future and mm -hmm. as we have the, the flex of what we do next um, with some of the more controversial changes that we have yes. to make. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely, it's, it's instantly, but I think we can put it on our website, too, to make available, but then also through our Blueprint 2030 engagement, really taking this out to the community so they're hearing, they're talking about it, and they're giving us feedback, um, you know, and giving them opportunity to really discuss it so that we hear from them on this. So, um, yeah. I, I was um, just seeing if the chair would entertain an opportunity for us to add that as a follow-up to make sure it's a prominent and not just mm -hmm. in the agenda, five rows down, and a specific thing. Dr. Jones. Thank you, uh, Dr. Collier, for this presentation. I felt like I was in a class, you know, so I just <laughs> soaked it off. I was like, yes. I'm Professor you know? Collier. So, so thank you for that. I feel like I learned a lot. Um, one thing I had, uh, a question I had, and just out of curiosity, um, from a perspective of the competitive environment in which we find ourselves with school choice, um, but also from a perspective of a selfish parent, um, self-interested parent. Um, what what would it take to expedite like the project based learning piece that I see that's related for like year mm -hmm. four right now? I know that's a phase two. What levers are there that is it like the training component that Ms. Buckner was talking about? What is it that makes it kind of where it's placed? Uh, yeah. Some of that had to do with trying to figure out, OK, which of the components needs to come first? And it kind of gets to what you were talking about, that mindset. I think that's where we need to start first. Um, but then also thinking about the spaces that we have in our buildings. Hopefully, by the time that it's listed there, we will have some bond work. I mean, we'll have the bond complete, and we have some funds to actually do some things with our buildings so that our buildings are actually supporting that project-based learning work. But it doesn't mean that we can't start, um, once again, piloting it and phasing it in earlier if we feel like uh, schools are capable of doing it. Just like I said, Northeast High School is already ready for this. They were talking about this before we even really started this work, which is why they're bringing 3D in, e in next year. A group of us are going to uh, Washington, D.C., to Potomac High School, where this work is being done well to actually see what it actually looks like, where students uh, are the same demographics as our students that are high performing. So we want to see what, what this actually is and what 3DE looks like uh, live, and then we'll pilot it in Northeast, and then we'll, we'll start expanding it as schools are ready. But the, I think the only thing that pushed it to the phase where it is is really around the bond, and then just also making sure that we don't overwhelm our system with too much change at one time. Yeah, I would love to do all now. <laughs> 
so I would say to the extent that it makes sense, if the board can attend some of the, like I'd love to go see this in action, okay. right? I mean, there's no better way for us to see what your ultimate okay. vision looks like in reality than to have us, those of us who can and want to go, to be there to experience that. Um, Ms. Ford? Hi, Dr. Collier. Thank Hello. you for your presentation. I appreciate the call out in your first slide about what is Blueprint 2030 and seeing academic achievement along with the student experience. I know that's something we've talked about for a while, so mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Just for my understanding, um, is what you presented um, providing more of like the framework, showing the different approaches and models and things like that that will be utilized. And with more engagement around this plan, we will see more of drill down logistics. We'll see a way how this is going to be operationalized. That That's is correct. We, okay. Right. Yeah. This is just the the, the broader framework. And then okay. as we engage, we, and we like I said, we're going to take this out. I'm proposing that we take it out. People have an opportunity to respond to it. We hear it. And then, and then also, I think it's important as we uh, drill down and, and plan all these components that we include that wide stakeholder group in some of these. So like representatives from different groups in mapping out what this looks like. So we're not just deciding what all of this looks like. So this is just like the larger framework. Yep. We have just a clear cut understanding that our thinking is if we do these things, then we will see an increase in student performance, academic achievements, and all of those things. If yes. If we do these things, then we'll see this. If we do those things well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well is the key mm -hmm. word. Okay. Yeah. All righty. Ms. Wolfsey. Thank you again for the presentation. I echoed everything everybody said. Um, I like what Ms. Ford was getting to because that was kind of what, one of my questions, which was, we know we just received accreditation, which we know is also the floor. What we've been showing the state is that we are closing gaps with the state mm -hmm. with our subgroup students, but we, KCPS, would like to see us do that faster. And I think for me as a board member, I do like chewy academic pieces of stuff to read. So if there's something in the links that you could point us to that will, or if it's not there, if you can send it to us, um, that shows that these things that you're recommending, how they do actually show their levers of acceleration for our particular students. That's kind of my takeaway mm -hmm. that was underneath everything, yes. but I, I'm not sure if that was a proper assumption. So um, it, in the presentation, most of the links will uh, illustrate that. I tried to use articles that, that illustrated that, but that are also pretty quick and easy to read so that anybody yeah. that accesses it can understand it and, 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 and walk away with a good understanding of it. The, I have a lot more research and articles that okay. I can share. The more dense articles, I can send those or share with the full board. Um, I'm creating a, a document where it's... Um, it's almost like a, a pamphlet that explains all of this, and it's a lot more detailed than what's in the presentation. Okay. So once that's done, you guys will get it, and you will have access to all of those articles and the research that we um, use for this, okay. for this work. Mm -hmm. I have one follow. It's not related to that, <laughs> but um, I think buy-in is a key part. But if we are able to authentically um, implement this, and this is a big lift, um, then I see this as being one of the things that makes this district truly differentiated from a, how our students are being educated, how our educators are actually um, the kind of people that we will attract because they want to be a part of this sort of um, vision, mm -hmm. academic vision, and families that will um, want to actually see their children receive these sorts of um, approach to education. So yes, I assume it will end up with you know closing gaps and whatnot, but it's so much more than that. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is truly differentiating. So if we can actually execute this over the next we 2030, can. then I, um, I think that puts us um, mm -hmm. leaps and bounds uh, mm -hmm. up against our competitors. All right. Well, I have some questions now, okay. <laughs> some additional ones, but I think these are going to be relatively easy. Dr. Collier, so let me just start by saying this is incredible. Thank um, you. It's exactly what the board asked for in terms of just being able to get to a pretty deep level mm -hmm. of understanding of what the framework should look like. And then, you know, ultimately at some point in the future, we've got to get to, okay, so what are the results we're going to 
guarantee, right, if we implement this well along the way. Um, but so on slide 14 under uh, academic components, there's a, a point, the very last bullet says lead teachers, which is oh, a new yeah. coaching model. Can you just describe that for yes. us? Yes, so next year we are piloting lead teacher uh, model. And so right now what we have are instructional coaches in some of our buildings, but what we're hearing from teachers and what some of the research is saying is that teachers who are actual practitioners in the classroom that are actually teaching, they are, um, they have a, a better chance of uh, supporting other classroom teachers. Other classroom teachers are receptive to the coaching that they receive because they're actual practitioners. So the model is where that teacher perhaps is teaching, co-teaching half of the day, and then the other part of the day, they're coaching teachers in their building. And so they're able to go into the classroom and, and give that uh, other teacher uh, immediate live feedback and it's from a and it's a lot of it is what perhaps they did that morning in their own classroom. So it's difficult for a teacher to say, well, you don't understand. I'm dealing with this. The teacher says, yes, I do. I understand. I just dealt with that. And let me show you how to do this. And so um, we have a teacher here uh, who actually did this model in New York. And so I researched it and looked at it. And it was a lot of really great data around um, how that school district turned around using that model. So once again, we want to pilot that to see how that goes. But it's actually where our teachers are the coaches. That's, I mean, to sum it up, teachers are coaches and not folks who are no longer in the classroom. And, and, and I know it, <clears throat> there are times, and we, we've said this before, where people may feel like, hey, we give all of these suggestions to the school district, they don't listen or they don't implement. And the thing that I often tell people is that we do. Right, I mean, it takes time. Like, just because people give us ideas doesn't mean that overnight we can implement. This is one where we got this through our teacher advisory uh, council. And, and, and I know it, it's taken us about two years, two years. To, to get to this mm -hmm. point, but we're here. And, I, and I, I guess it's just a lesson for everybody that we do listen. And there are some things that we can do immediately, and there are some other things where it will take time. We have to build it out. We have to make sure that we can fund it. We have to make sure that we have a clear understanding of what it's going to look like when we beta test it. So that's the reason why we're only looking at four schools. Mm -hmm. We shared this with our building principals, and many of them are like, why only four? Well, right. we need to see if it works. Um, that's part of our problem. When we try to go and go at scale, generally things tend to fail. So we can learn from what, what worked well with mm -hmm. this, and if we think that it's going to get us the results that we need, then it be, we think it becomes a bigger budgetary conversation and potential support to, to be able to do it at scale over time. And the same thing with PBL. This yep. gives us an opportunity to, to beta test it, and we're doing the same thing right now with competency-based grading. We're beta testing. We have about three or four schools that we're doing this in, and we're, so just know that we're trying and we're exploring things, and if these things work, you know, great, and if they don't, at least we did give it a try and tried to do something different. I'd rather fail, fail going forward than not trying nothing at all. So this lead, if I understood you right, is this lead teacher's uh, coaching model versus having instructional coaches come from central office and go sit in a class and then yeah, provide feedback. And I don't want to alarm our instructional coaches. Okay. Like, we're not we're not <laughs> we're not touching well, our we're instructional not, yeah, coaches. It's not a job thing, right? Yeah. But is it but but what essentially well, what you're it, saying it is it could if you're change. A, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If yeah. we find that that model is more effective, then that's what we'll do. Yeah. Um, but once again, we're going to beta test it. We're going to see um, how effective it actually is for a couple years and then if it's if it's a better model for us, then that's the way we'll go. Understood. Okay, on the very next slide, one thing that felt a little missing on the portrait of a student was, uh, you know, wanting them to have high EQ, right? So you think about social emotional learning, like I don't yeah. see that component built in here. And so it's yeah. not really a question. I just thought, huh, this is interesting. Yeah. Like if we want our kids to leave prepared for life and have like really EQ, which we know is a pretty good predictor of a person's ability to be successful in life, um, that seems a little missing to me. Just mm -hmm. so just feedback, really. Okay. Uh, um, we grapple with a lot of different characters. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, you could probably <laughs> so, add about 15 mm -hmm. more uh, bubbles to each one of those. Um, on slide 30, um, I'm interested on the on the mathematics side of things. Um, and now I've got to interpret my own handwriting. Um, 
Yeah. I'll come back to that or send it in an email. That is awful. Okay. Apologies. I'll um, send and it then, in Friday update. Yeah. <laughs> and then I guess the last thing was really just more of a, uh, on slide 38, um, around, I mean, I was blown up. I literally almost came to tears a little bit when it comes to the, your second bullet around establishing a family engagement mm -hmm. empowerment center. I mean, yeah. talk about stepping beyond the four walls of the district and providing the ability for this entire community to wrap itself around not just the students but the parents yep. right and bringing in social services and training yep. and all of those things yes. it's it's so meaningful and it's such an incredible opportunity for us to use taxpayer dollars right mm -hmm. to go improve the health of everyone who touches our kids i mean that yep. is uh, that's incredible so i i just wrote this with a big exclamation point i, I love it so thank, thank you. you yeah all as right, we Dr. support our families then yep. we can better support our students uh, much more succinctly said than what I just said. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Bedell. Oh, well, thank you, Dr. Collier. Okay, thank uh, you. We really appreciate thank you all for your feedback. The uh, presentation, and we are ready for the second phase of this uh, superintendent's report, which is uh, our engagement update. <clears throat> and as I stated earlier, uh, we wanted to make sure that we offer a recap of what we've done. Uh, given what you've heard today around the academic visioning, what our plans are as we continue to engage everybody and to make sure that the narrative is truly focused on uh, touching voices that need to be touched uh, throughout our community, but centering it all around this vision that we have with academics, first and foremost, that will then decide on what our facilities and all of the scenarios that we're getting ready to go into, how that will support this academic plan. So we'll pass it over to Ms. Waitu at this time. Excellent, thank you Dr. Bedell, board. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to discuss this this evening. Uh, you do have in front of you the same slide. Can you guys hear me okay? I feel like I'm far away from the microphone, but I'm cognizant of germs. Um, You've seen this slide as it relates to the engagement timeline reminder and the snapshot of our phases. And this being, um, as we're transitioning from phase one and two into phase three of scenarios, our up-to-date um, information on where we are currently. Uh, as Dr. Bedell said too, as we look at the academic vision, this chance to ask our public, ask our teachers, ask our kids, ask our parents how they feel about it, is what you're gonna hear in some of the feedback we've already gotten. And then as we go back out to the framework with what Dr. Collier presented, it's just one more opportunity to again ingrain that message of the vision along with the scenarios that we present to our community. Engagement to date. Now you guys saw this slide um, in your packet and it's very small print, but we wanted to show the breadth of what we've done thus far in our phase one and phase two engagement. From assessment to goal setting, these are a pretty good rundown of what we've done for our community, staff, families, and students. Um, phase one assessment, we talk about the advisory team. This is gonna be reiterated in the presentation you've already seen from me, but we do have an advisory team made up of 100 plus folks who join us once a month, either virtually or in person, to help guide the work in the Blueprint 2030 process. Um, you see here, um, Central school secondary reviews, focus groups, market research, uh, thought exchange, online engagement platforms that we've used. And then we talk about goal setting phases of student summits, uh, back to school nights, summer fest, lunch discussions at every school with our staff in the spring and in the fall, uh, key influencer focus groups, all of the things that we've talked about along the way over the course of the semester. The next slide, um, this was not in your packet from Friday, but we added it after some discussion as a team. This is a really good job of recapping all the touch points that we've had thus far in our Blueprint 2030 engagement. So you'll see 18,000 plus touch points thus far, 7,200 plus parent, guardian, exclusive. And then that next bullet point of the fall survey participants, over 3,000 of those, as I was presenting to the Link Commission on Monday, I was really keen to point out that 45% were students, 26% parents, 13% staff, and 16% an unknown mix. And what I highlighted here is that the importance of our student voice in this process was really intentional on how we delivered that survey availability to them 
and then how they took the time to respond to that. Link, uh, the commission really loved that approach about making sure that our students were heard in the process as it does affect their personal education as they go up through the system and graduate from KCPS. And as you heard in the feedback summary um, to what Dr. Collier talked about in academic vision, these bullet points here are what we've heard so far in the process. So I wanted to really highlight um, our student requests for equity across the system and helping their peers who are behind. That was echoed loud and clear in our in-person events we had with our students, as well as the online feedback we had from students. And then one of the things that we've been talking about in our content and our um, boards at our gallery walks, we've been comparing KCPS offerings to our suburban counterparts. And our students who see that data and see those opportunities really want some of the same, if not more, opportunity that our suburban counterparts have around the region. And then I love this, and we talked about how we love this, our students are very in tune to what their classmates experience and feel, and they very much want their classmates' mental health um, and opportunities to be um, supported at school. And so how do our peers help our peers? So it was very, uh, very intentional feedback we heard. Uh, teachers, this speaks to Ms. Buckner and then Dr. Collier's points about uh, t teachers want more time to collaborate and plan. We hear this from them. How do we maximize PD opportunities and then implement that really strongly in our schools? Uh, we're hearing about diverse tier-based professional development, uh, more reading math interventionists, interventions, and then mental support, mental health supports for, for not only themselves, but for each other and for them students and for their students. And then the third bullet point here, um, what we hear from parents, strong academic environment and a safe environment. Uh, they want places where their kids can go get really well-rounded education and be safe in doing so. So just to round out going from phase two into phase three, we are transitioning now into that phase three where we're talking about scenarios. Uh, one of the things that we've been doing in this kind of period between phase two and phase three is going out and talking to our school advisory committees, our school advisory councils. As you heard Ms. Lyle say, we're really working on getting those school-based uh, parent groups to have one-to-one -one time with us talking about Blueprint 2030 and getting that school-based feedback. As we work with Travis, who's our consultant um, at Vireo, we're working on the multilingual approach to gather more of those voices that we might not have heard at this point. Uh, that means how do we work with our translators to possibly go into neighborhoods and homes where the language is spoken in that neighborhood and we have translators in these in-home conversations talk about Blueprint and their needs as we go into the future of KCPS's educational offerings. We're also working with 70 plus organizations and partners to do visits to their meetings, get on their agendas. You all provided me with some of the organizations that you wanted to tag along with and be present at these conversations. So we've been scheduling those since December, in the process of doing so now. And these spreadsheets that you're not intended to read, uh, but they're samples of all of our tracking um, with who we've engaged, how we've engaged them, the message and the feedback mechanisms that we use to engage them, as well as what's upcoming and what's already passed. Um, we also have the list of organizations that we're currently scheduling so that we can see um, very clearly who we've touched and who we haven't touched yet in those partner, um, partner organizations. The online survey is still currently available on our Blue Bridge 23 webpage. Um, if you are not one of those 3,337 folks who've taken the online survey, it's still available if you'd like to do so. And then as we get to the in-person component of the phase three scenarios, just really really prepping the board and the community that as we bring in um, consultant to help form and approach these scenarios, we want to be really clear on the content that we're going to display, really be really clear on the approach that we use just to have those conversations. We have to gather all that before we go out there and start talking about scenarios. We want to make sure that we have input, feedback, we have different ways to um, display and show off those scenarios that are really um, conducive to people talking about uh, refining it, adjusting it, and then making up their own scenarios in some ways. And so those in-person community chats that we'll be calling them will have in-person opportunities as well as uh, virtual opportunities in late March and early April. April. Again, that timeline is very much dependent on um, when we have started to form those scenarios for our community. All right. These next couple slides really just overview. Um, this is what we call our mirror, um, where we're looking at the post-it note forms of what we'll be doing for the next couple phases. So 
just talked about March and April at those scenarios, community chats, in person and virtual, an online component through Thought Exchange, which our community is familiar with, as well as Balancing Act. Um, Ms. Quinley has been working with that Balancing Act platform to look at numbers and finances and budgeting and how we allocate numbers to some of the things that we want to do. And Balancing Act is a very interactive platform that we can get feedback in a very easy and understandable way as we look at numbers and finances associated with Blueprint 2030. Um, engagement process and schedules, goal setting, phase three scenarios. Again, this is just kind of a depiction of where we are and where we'll be going with some of the strategies and tactics, what we'll have available uh, during our process and, and scheduling. And then again, this is phase four, phase five, and phase six. We want to be very upfront that as we get to recommendations, May, this summer, that, that then leads to implementation and evaluation, the things that you're talking about, how do we implement with um, fidelity and that we're measuring things along the way. And as you see here, these are all kind of to be determined as we think about evaluation implementation and the timeline for that once we get to recommendations. And Dr. Collier's timeline was a pretty good indication of how fast we'll move on some of those phases for the academic vision. These are kind of our post notes around engagement goals. So we have our process, but these are the goals associated with each of those um, phases. So we've been through phase two, the goal setting. You've experienced that with us along the way. We've been talking about that each month. Phase three scenarios, as we want to look at the outcomes of kind of the goals, the goal setting, the mission, the academic vision, um, continue identifying blue per 2030 champions, influencers, as I think is the word that Mr. Hogan used. Um, input solutions on these scenarios, and then working with those champions to successfully develop um, and uh, implement those recommendations along the way. We have really good champions on our Blueprint advisory team, as well as our DAC to help support this initially. All right, and then phase four and five and six, again, goals in this, um, working to finalize advisory committee endorsements. Um, as we get to recommendations, do we want the Blueprint Advisory Committee to actually come and present some of the recommendations to you alongside us as an executive team presenting those? Um, and again, how do we have those champions help us roll that out? And then what you'll see here as we get to implementation and evaluation, um, what do those teams look like as we do make changes to our academics, to our programming, um, to the betterment of the, the community? What does it look like to have help and champions do that for the buy-in portion of that phase? And as you see here, um, as we prepare for a potential bond conversation, these things are all very important for the messaging, for the understanding, to get to where we have to be to start talking about a bond for our community and to get things done um, as the vision lays out. So next steps for engagement. Again, we're transitioning to phase three, our school advisory councils, the multilingual approach, the organizations I talked about, the online survey, and then again, prepping for those community chats um, in person, virtual, late March and early April. All right, questions and comments? All right, thank you, Ms. Blachel. Questions from the board? Okay, Dr. Jones. Thank you, Ms. Blachel. Um, one of the one of the things that I noticed, and I know um, I've had a couple conversations about this, uh, Dr. Bedell, is I think that these um, engagement opportunities are really helpful. I know I've known parents or talked to parents around the community who have attended these, and you know, so folks really do appreciate this type of engagement. So I just thank your your team for doing that. I think um, one of the one of the concerns I have is just I think sometimes the language that can be used if we're talking to parents. And we're talking to, you know, sometimes I guess even students, but the two I've studied, I think maybe there's been some adjustments made for those two audiences, different, you know, differentiation between those. But even when we're talking to parents, you know, if your words, if words are being used like interdisciplinary and pedagogy and, you know, like those words can really put people on the margin. Those are just a couple mm -hmm. I jotted down. But mm -hmm. when I heard those, I was like, oh, man, if I didn't, you know, wasn't in the academy at some point, I probably would not have a easy chance of understanding what you were talking about in the context of a strategy for education going forward. So I do think that um, you guys would probably reach even more people and empower more listeners, more parents to, to weigh in on this if they didn't feel intimidated by some of the 
just the way that things are conveyed. So if that made sense. So I think that will only help. Um, I love that comment. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, when we had our town halls in December, we did a big presentation before we had kind of the feedback and the comments. And I certainly sense where some of that feedback is coming from. So uh, agree and hundred percent taken on that. Yeah, we we as educators sometimes uh, use words that are, aren't translatable, and we can work on that for sure. So I'll just a, a quick interjection here um, before I pass it on to the other board members. I think this is, Dr. Bedell, this is something that you and I, I have on my list for our conversation on Friday around the board retreat is, you know, emphasizing, I didn't realize this, so Dr. Jones was, you know, texting me during the Southeast event and, I mean, it, in classic Dr. Jones fashion, educating me on something that I hadn't really put any time into at all. And I thought it was interesting, you know, as I started talking to more and more people about it, what I learned is, you know, even like newspapers are written at a sixth grade level, right? So that most people can sort of relate and, and really consume and digest the information. And I think as we think about communications externally completely, we should be thinking about some of that um, as well. And we can talk about it more robustly at the at the retreat, but I, I know that it, this has been sort of communicated to the district in the past, and so I think the more we can start to think about how we make that a common practice, the more I think our community will just be able to really engage with us on a much more meaningful level. Um, so just something to talk about. Um, other board members? Oh, uh, Ms. Ford? No? Oh, sorry. Thanks, Mr. Rebarka. Did you have questions, sir? I do. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you to this. And I couldn't echo uh, Dr. Jones' comments anymore. I mean, I think that's incredibly important to speak at the language that people can understand. Um, and thank you. I think I was at several presentations for where you had translators and the translation devices that help multilingual folks. Um, the question I have is around engagement of what I would say non-repetitive stakeholders, right? Because I think when I've attended a few of these things, I've seen some of the same folks kind of involved and engaged. And that's, that's great and important. Um, folks like Angie Lyle, who was here earlier, I think are critical to have in conversations, but I worry that we're not reaching those hard to reach folks. And so what, what strategies are we deploying to try and engage every aspect of our, our constituency in the district and even those outside of it, right? Um, because I think if I, as I've been involved in like his, Hispanic advisory, some have said, you know, the presentation was so dense and robust that I didn't even know what I was supposed to give after that, um, or I wasn't prepared enough and there wasn't subsequent follow up to really give you my full opinion or understand beyond the context of like closing school buildings, what this could mean for us. So how are we breaking through to folks? Mm -hmm. uh, so the strategies that, some of the strategies that you saw in the presentation, again, more personalized home visits for some of our families who might not come to us, but that we're reaching out to with that's, whether it's a language barrier or whether it's something they just can't, don't have the ability to come to us on a regular basis to some of our events. So that's one of the reasons um, that we're going to do those personal home visits. Um, you'll also see us with our um, outreach to our partner organizations. We're doing some second touch points on some of those. You're seeing some first touch points on some of those as well. So that's where we're going out and doing that messaging with our partners. I think um, one of the things that does continue to be a challenge for us is how do we make sure that we're touching every family who has um, students in KCPS. So. That's where those SACs are really important at our individual schools where we have people who um, are engaged at the school level and then can engage at the district level as well. So those are challenges for us that we're trying to work through. But one of the things I also want to um, note is that this is a really noisy time. It's a really noisy time for school districts. It's a noisy time for society in general. Um, it's hard for some folks to be online and join meetings virtually or even join in person due to um, COVID precautions or what their sentiments might be towards the pandemic. And so I don't want to discount that we're offering multiple ways to engage, that we're offering uh, multiple communications to let people know about how we're trying to engage this community. Um, we have wonderful media partners who are helping share the message along the way. And so I just don't want to discount that as we try to cut through the noise of everything else happening, uh, we are still trying to get our message through and we are making some good progress around the conversation, um, but we could always use help um, from anyone in the room and from those at the dais to encourage folks to join us virtually, to take surveys, to join us in person, to reach out to us personally and say, hey, Mrs. Wachel, I've heard about this in, in theory, but can you walk me through this personally? 
I've done that with numerous people just to have personal conversations, um, sat down and done that on the phone or in person or, or virtually. So I just want to make sure that we understand that it is very noisy and um, we have to have a little bit of grace when it comes to couching this message in the grand scheme of what we're doing here at KCPS right now. Um, yeah, and I, I couldn't agree more. There's a lot happening in general. I just want to make sure that for something so important and robust that we are breaking through and our way that we're doing that is effective. Um, I think you had mentioned the SACs, which is great, and the more of a need to bolster up some of our um, organizations that aren't as strong in some of our schools. Um, and, you know, I think some of the elements that I noticed um, when I went to Southeast program, uh, the childcare, the food, that stuff that I think maybe could help with the advertisement and engagement, right? I didn't know about that until I was there. And maybe it was mentioned, but I don't think it really rang true to folks um, that, hey, you know, bring your kids. We want you to come and engage in that way. And we have some um, supported staff to help with those components. The other element is, is the website. I, it is so academic, I think is a great term for it, is, you know, I will go find what I need to find if I know it's there. Um, if I'm just going to find even this presentation, I'm not sure where I focus on or how I navigate, okay, we're on phase three right now. And, and it's all, all the information's there. So it's just the challenge of how we convey it, I think, to draw people's attention to those things and moments that we want them to. So just some, some feedback on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. So um, Jesse, Mr. Lang and I um, have actually taken time over the last month to look at that web page specifically and try to organize it to where it's more readable, where it's more um, sequential in the order of things happening. So I appreciate that feedback as we've been looking at that very um, closely to try to do more of that ease of use and navigation piece. Ms. Wolsey. Thank you for your presentation. I um, don't envy you because I think you have one of the hardest jobs with regards to um, Blueprint 2030, which is the engagement in, as you mentioned, this environment. Um, uh, one of the things that, um, since I guess I'm one of the ones that was here, I was on the other side of the dais through mm -hmm. master plan, so I did participate in it. Um, the, the thing that I know that the board, when they did end up voting on master plan, that was really important to them, was knowing that um, not only that the breadth that we did reach partners and parents and students and for feedback, but it was that depth component, which is your challenge right now, I think that you've, um, you know, explained. But I think that's where we're gonna have to just continue to um, try to stretch and find new ways to reach, as Mr. Abarca said, we do see, and we saw it again also in Master Plan, just so you know, it's not just you. Um, it's the same folks that show up, mm -hmm. but one of the things I will say that seemed to, um, that, that I have noticed a little bit of a difference between then and now is, there was a level of um, dialogue, I think, that went a little bit deeper. Um, I think you were trying to get there at the Southeast um, meeting where we broke into the groups and tried to get people talking to one another. I think the more that we can do that at the school level especially, mm -hmm. the problem and the challenge is going to be the SACs we know are the signature SACs. Um, we have a few, you know, at some of the others, but if we can work with the principals, I think, to try and, um, it's gonna take a little bit of um, communicating ahead of time. Uh, you can't just say we're gonna have a meeting and expect everybody to get there. So I would be willing to brainstorm a little bit on that because just having had some past experience in that world. But I think that is gonna be one of the key things is trying to get at that school level it doesn't have to be a SAC, it could be LINK actually helps us. That was a big part of um, master plan was LINK mm -hmm. and site councils um, since we didn't have SACs or PTAs at all the schools. But um, as a board member now voting on this sort of thing, what I will be definitely looking for is the quantifying of that breadth and depth mm -hmm. because again, I don't, I worry that when um, I see certain numbers and they say it's um, families, that it's only a, a mainly representing the signature family perspective. Mm -hmm. That's one of my bigger concerns. So, yep. um, 
I volunteer to help in whatever way you need me to um, when you. it comes to the school level stuff. Yeah, great, thank you. Just surveying the board. Okay, I guess I will jump in. Um, so I, I'm gonna try to organize my thoughts here, um, which may take a, a second. I have some general sort of data questions uh, mm -hmm. on slide 50 um, that I guess I'll start there. So I just wanna get some clarity, Ms. Wachel. Mm -hmm. um, I, I started doing the math and maybe that was a mistake, but I see 18,000 plus touch points thus far. 7,200 parent slash guardian exclusive, not sure what exclusive means, and then 3,300 fall participants. So I started doing the math and I went, okay, so there's 2,500 touch points that are missing there. Can you help me understand that remaining 2,500? So if I do 18,000 minus 7,200 minus 3,300, I get, I think, roughly 2,500 or so. So, and Jesse, you can come up if you want to. Jesse helps us uh, analyze it and um, put together our data. But as you look at the 16% unknown mix, including community members and partners, some of the touch points that we have, we don't ask about demographics or we don't ask about how they heard about the survey or the conversation. Some of those might be community partner organizations that we've had uh, conversations with or means that we've gone to. So it's not gonna total in, it's not gonna total in total. It's not gonna be an even total when we look at that because there's some data that we just don't track when it comes to who they are where they're from and how they got in touch with the district. Do you want to clarify that, Jesse? No, yeah, that's exactly right. So that 18,000 um, represents everything in its entirety of people who have been at a meeting or taken a survey. The 7,200 plus, uh, that really represents, we know at least 7,200 of that 18,000 were parents, uh, and that's it, it was strictly for parents. A lot of those um, additional numbers included a lot of other folks, so I don't know who's a parent and who's not necessarily. Um, and then the 3,300 that took the survey, that's just one example uh, of a survey that happened. So there's a lot of other things that add up to that 18,000, whether it be some kind of a meeting, another focus group or something that just aren't included on this slide right now. Why don't we gather the demographics on every person that we query either through a survey or an in-person meeting? We usually try to do um, any any time um, that the opportunity presents itself. Sometimes if you're doing like an online component, somebody skips that question, which I would love for them to answer it, but for whatever reason they skip it and they answer the other ones. So that's kind of contributing to that. Um, sometimes when we do a public meeting, they'll some people miss the sign-in sheet or they'll skip that on the sign-in sheet. Um, so we kind of just run into some of the tracking, but. If, uh, if we can, we try to intentionally ask every time because it is important to track who's involved. Even um, knowing like the school level is really important. Um, to uh, uh, Ms. Wolfsey's point about the engagement of certain communities, that's something that's been really interesting, which I'm glad I got to come up here to, to speak because I really wanted to say that. Um, through the pandemic is when we did this during master plan or other planning initiatives, one thing that I always noticed is like when we were gonna do a survey, I knew who was gonna respond to that survey, almost. Like I was like, okay, these schools are the ones that are gonna come out and gonna show that. But it's been interesting this time around, and it, I don't know if it's because of the pandemic or other things, but now we're two years into a pandemic, and I don't know if schools have more access to technology or people are more used to working with it, but like the one survey that we did that adds up to that 3,300, like 800 parents took one of those, and when I looked at the school breakdown, the top school that participated was Banneker Elementary which I was surprised, I'm like, okay, one of our neighborhood elementary schools. The second school was Faxon, another neighborhood elementary school, which actually was higher than some of these signature schools. And so we see that a lot of the participants, um, the schools that participated was because of the way the school pushed out the survey. It had to do with how the leader was presenting it. They already had that relationship. And so we were getting really good feedback from those schools. So it was interesting to see this time around, um, there was more participation from some of our neighborhood schools than we've seen and I think it's part of that technology piece. Maybe people have the technology, they're more used to it, and we have people in those buildings who are pushing those out to their families in effective ways. I, I, get, I get your point. I would think on, particularly on the electronic surveys, that if the segments are really important to you, you mark those particular questions required, and then you're going to get it. Now, you're gonna have some people who are just gonna select whatever and move on, but you're, you're gonna get more robust data, right? Um, so how, how are we engaging the different segments differently? 
So are we engaging with parents differently than students, students differently with, than with neighborhood associations, or is, it, is our engagement pretty similar across each individual segment? Uh, let's give some examples. So um, throughout the fall, you guys have been listening to the monthly updates about Blueprint as well as marketing. So one example is the students. So not only did we issue that online survey to middle school and high school students, of which 45% are students who've responded to that, we also our student summit, uh, which had students from every single high school and district come visit with us in personal one-to-one -one conversations, look at our content boards, offer sticky notes, offer verbal conversations with us. Um, and we also have our SDAC, our Student District Advisory Committee, who has this as a topic for every one of their um, meetings that they discuss. One of the things that the kids are doing too for us is this spring they're going to be using their social channels um, to help spread our next online um, component, whether it's Thought Exchange or Balancing Act. So that's kind of four examples of the way we segmented our students to have a conversation with us about it. Um, and then if we want to look at the segments of you know parents, uh, maybe community members, um, we've had the online portion available. We've also had our staff lunches at every school. Um, we've also um, had teacher advisory council. We talked about this principal advisory council. Where we talk about this principal means where we talk about it. Um, so there's just numerous ways that we're having conversations and collecting that feedback. Um, looking at the numbers when it comes to like partner organizations, we typically are doing um, a presentation that's modified or adjusted to that audience. Um, where we're talking about like specifically the link commission on Monday. It was very much geared to how link interacts with KCPS. We got our full accreditation. Thank you for being a partner. Here's what's upcoming in Blooper 2030. Here's how you can support the message and also um, provide feedback in the process. So we're tailoring the message and the presentation to our audience when we go out to our partners. Um, does that answer your question a little bit about what, what we are getting at, how we tailor it to certain audiences? Uh, sort of. I, I guess what I'm ultimately trying to understand is do you know across each segment which type of engagement is most successful? And if so, is that data that you, that you can bring forward? Um, I guess I'm not understanding your question, like the difference between if we're having a conversation versus having a survey versus asking for feedback. My mic keeps turning off. <laughs> um, oh, well, yes, please. <laughs> uh, what I'm trying to understand, so from an efficiencies perspective, right, like I wouldn't want to go engage with a particular segment um, the same way every time if I know that that one way isn't very successful. It's not yielding the results that I desire, mm -hmm. right? I would want to measure the different types of engagements with each segment and then for the ones that are, I'm getting like very high results, I would want to repeat that type of engagement with that segment. That's what sure. I'm trying to, to get to, but it sounds like you're not measuring it in that way. Uh, I would say probably not measuring it that in that way, no. And Jesse, do you have a different take on that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, when we think about obviously measuring engagement, the one measurement is participation which is, you know, kind of on that. But um, there's another component of measuring successful engagement, like what you're actually getting your feedback from, you know, like what people are telling you. And so I think there are um, different ways that we can look at it. I know that for sure we've just been trying to do different ways of reaching people, you know, like if one, one thing doesn't work, try something else. Um, what we've seen thus far for me personally, I've enjoyed anytime you can get the focus group, anytime you can get the smaller conversations, that's where you get your most robust engagement. So usually that's why we've been trying to speak with staff, like when we go to those staff lunches, that was intentional as, a, as opposed to just sending something out, it was better to have the conversation with them. Um, not that we wouldn't try to reach them in another way, but we know that that was very successful. Same with parents, um, we, we wanted to have that opportunity to have those smaller focus groups. And so that's something that we, the reason why we're trying to go out to the SACs now is to get maybe the, that smaller uh, group, because typically that is how you have the, the deeper conversations of engagement, so not just measuring it but the numbers wise but also measuring based upon the feedback that you're getting yeah i totally appreciate the the difference between activity versus the results you're trying to get out of a successful engagement what what i'm hearing though is that you're you have anecdotal information to support what you're saying but there's no you don't you haven't compiled data to support that is that a is that a true statement it's okay if you're not I think that's kind of oh don't fall yeah, I think that's a fair assessment. Yeah, yeah. anecdotal. Yeah, that's a fair okay. assessment. You know, for example, as I'm sitting down having a conversation at one of our partner organizations two weeks ago, 
I, my question to them is, hey, how do you want us to approach the scenarios? What would be the best way for you to hear about scenarios and then provide your feedback? And they were giving me great information about, well, thinking about this, you're already doing this, and um, let's try to get to here as we get to March. So it's definitely, definitely more anecdotal, um, but you are also seeing some hard numbers and some of the things that we've gathered on the screen. I swear I'm not touching it. I have no idea what's going on right now. Um, not funny, Ms. Cortez. <laughs> this is what happens when you give your colleague, you know, grief for months about the microphone. Um, how, so I remember several months ago we were looking at some data. It was, it was probably after one of the first sort of main engagement activities or certainly where information was coming back into the board. And there was a slide that you have that's got sticky notes where students are engaging and they're writing down sort of, you know, their feedback based on that particular in, engagement. And um, one of Ms. Buckner's um, comments was, this is good, but what I'd like to see is sort of the trends. And so if I look at the slides, specifically um, 50 under the feedback summary, you've got sort of, uh, I'm guessing what are trends. I think what would be probably more interesting and, and valuable to see is for those students who are saying those two things, like how many students make up that student population that you surveyed, and how many of them are selecting these, and what other options are they also selecting? Okay. To be able to give us sort of data over each one of those engagements that would show us like 55% of our kids really believe that they need you know, the same extracurricular options um, that their students in the suburban districts have. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I, June, I want you to actually take an action item on that one in particular, because I think that data will be really, really meaningful in terms of being able to show that, one, we know how many students are engaged, and two, what are students ultimately telling us? What's their top two or three answers, et cetera? Yep, so we went over some of that data um, in some of our previous month's presentations where we actually broke down some of those questions and then um, told you as the student response, this is what they were highly rating. So we can go back and pull some of that for you again. Yep, and then um, one of the, the pieces when you talk about the sticky notes and that student summit engagement conversation, we're probably not gonna have the data around how many kids rate the sticky note high. It was just more an anecdotal feedback gathering mechanism for our kids at that point, but the survey certainly has that data for us. Yeah, I guess I wouldn't consider the sticky notes anecdotal. I mean, it's data. Now it sure. takes, in fact, I remember a response, a back and forth Mm -hmm. around someone was, we had a student or someone who was gathering all that information from the sticky notes so that we could then go analyze it. So I, I will just disagree around that being anecdotal. It's oh, very okay. much data. Sure. You've just got to go compile it and then serve it up so that you understand, right, what the data is telling you. Sure. Um, th the other thing I guess I'd call out is I remember back in the fall we talked about an RFP being submitted to help around community engagement. Whatever happened with that RFP? Um, we didn't have an RFP submitted. Um, we actually contracted with Travis, who you've met at several of our um, Blueprint advisory team meetings as well as our board conversations. And Travis works with Vireo, um, who is contracted through ACI Boland. Okay. Interesting. All right, I'll, I'll move on, um, just in the interest of time. On slide 47, um, I'm guessing there, uh, well, I'm not guessing, I know that this is a sampling of data, you're, uh, we don't have it up here. It's, it's the one that has um, engagement to date, and then it's got the, um, the list of the different community organizations, and then what board members, a few of the board members that selected a particular one to participate in. Uh, yeah, that one. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so if we really believe and want the board to authentically engage, um, I think one of the things we're going to have to do is, so I got two different invites over the last week for events that are coming up. I think one was with the chamber and one's with more squared. Mm -hmm. uh, no one said, hey, Nate, what's your calendar like? Right? The events were just scheduled and I'm expected to either drop everything or I'm expected to, to shift things around mm -hmm. to accommodate. So I think if, if we're going to encourage board participation, and I think we should, we're a part of the process, we've got to like collaborate through scheduling things when board members can actually attend. Okay, so we're scheduling those according to the organization's schedule and their set meetings. And so we're trying not to alter their scheduled and set meetings too much, but we're trying to accommodate their schedules. And so we'll send you invites as we schedule those. Um, we're trying to lean more towards there. 
um, calendars and not altering their regularly scheduled meetings. But if there is room for us, like if it's a conversation with just maybe five of us, we'll certainly work with your schedules to see when you're available versus their set scheduled meetings. Oh, that is really, so it's five seconds apparently, Miss Cortez of no talking that the microphone shuts off on you. Um, I totally get that if it's a monthly meeting, but mm -hmm. why not schedule it a month? I mean, we don't have the luxury of a ton of time, so you can't like schedule three months in advance, but certainly, I mean, I got a meeting, invite. I'm pretty sure it was today, it might have been yesterday, for a February 1st meeting, mm -hmm. right? Like this, the board has other jobs and obligations as well. I mean, we just gotta collaborate more meaningfully, I think, and this is, look, this is to Dr. Bedell, right? If, if we want us to be involved, we've gotta make sure that we actually have the ability to attend. So if that means maybe pushing it, or even working with that organization to say, hey, I know you've got a monthly meeting, but we're considering calendars of a very busy superintendent as well as a board who wants to engage, right? It, 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 mm -hmm. it starts to feel like you don't really want board um, engagement. Now, I, come on, Nate Hogan. I, mean, that's I, I, I like. disagree with that. Well, You're I mean, we, to we we absolutely want board and board engagement. This is a complex system, mm -hmm. trying to engage with thousands of people, multiple organizations. It's not it's not going to be perfect, and what we're trying to do. So I I take offense to that. Well, I, I'm sorry you're offended, Dr. Bedell, that's not the intent, but I do think if you want, it's just like anything else, you wouldn't ask a community member to engage or tell them that you want them to engage and then schedule something assuming that they've just got free time when you schedule it. How is that, in what environment does that, is that okay? So I guess I'm, what I'm hearing, Mr. Hogan, is that um, as we're scheduling these meetings with our community partners according to their schedules, you want us to maybe check with you first, make sure you're available before we confirm availability on their meeting agenda. Is that more conducive to what you're maybe asking for? Look, I'm just asking for us to consider that board members have other things going on and they can't always just drop everything to attend a meeting. I think that's a reasonable thing to request of the district. Sure. Right, I wouldn't go try to schedule a meeting with you and someone else without going, hey, I, I'm assuming Ms. Wachel has other things going on. I'm gonna try to coordinate between the three entities that I'm trying to schedule a meeting with. That just seems, I mean, we literally just did this with an organization that we're scheduling for an April conversation, right? I didn't just throw it on a schedule and then not reach out to Dr. Bedell, you know, to Sandra to get what Dr. Bedell's schedule is. That seems like a reasonable request. I'm not sure why that seems, you know, is so upsetting. And we can table it. We've got time on Friday. I just, it just doesn't make sense to me. I, I, I think the part for me, Mr. Hogan, is when you say it appears that we don't want board in involvement and board engagement. And I, I don't think that's, fair at all, we, we're working on a very tight timeline. We're trying to get these, these meetings scheduled and, 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 and yeah, I mean, even with me, I have to make some accommodations mm -hmm. to try to make this work on my schedule at last minute, just like anybody else. It's, it's, it's not going to be, like they, they're not gonna be able to, I can't have them work around my schedule. As soon as we're able to get them confirmed, if I have to move some things on my schedule to do it, because some of this stuff, I had to speak on a Sunday. It was kind of last minute, but I said, okay, this is important. I need to figure out how to do it. I, I, I didn't have it well in advance. That was the opportunity for that group that we spoke with to be able to hear from me. So I, I guess what I'm saying is it's, it's, not, it's not always going to be optimal that we gotta, we gotta work on the Dell schedule. We gotta get the board schedule. We gotta make sure we got cabinet members. Mm -hmm. It's, 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 it's a lot, it's just not that easy. And I, that's, that's all I'm saying. So I, I don't want, for the record, people hearing that, you know, we're, we're, we're doing this in a way to ensure that we don't have, you know, board member involvement in the process. That, that's the part that was offensive. I understand, not asking for perfection. I'm asking for some consideration that the board has other obligations as well. And, and I, again, I think that's a fair request. Um, th that's all my questions. I don't think that the board has, oh, Ms. Wolfsey apparently does have a question. Um, I, it's not so much a question. Uh, one, one possible solution to the dialogue that has just um, transpired is we are a board of seven. I know we did get the list and we were asked to identify which ones, but I do wonder if there's a way that we could um, maybe make that a doc where we could all see it so that if one can't attend, 
if we end up getting in that particular situation that others could step in to mm -hmm. maybe attend in their place because I do sure. understand the the balance between organizations and already scheduled um, meetings that they have that we could take advantage of without having to get that organization to come to our schedule to set that aside um, one thing I just would really encourage and I think it goes back to the whole school thing I think it was mr. Lang I don't know if he's still here um, oh hi Jesse um, is that when you mentioned Faxon and Banneker. A red flag should go up immediately to understand why did they have such a great response? Because I think that we are missing an opportunity that could be really helpful to you, Ms. Wachel, in the community engagement component. Okay, I don't know if it's you guys, but it is hot up here all of a sudden. <laughs> oh my God. And, and Linda knows I'm never hot. Um, I'm just dying. Sorry, I thought it was me, but I was like, um, back to Banneker and Faxon. What I, and I, I noticed this because I'm, I'm working with my principal now and trying to do a regular communication with our parents. So they basically just know what's going on in our building. Mm -hmm. But I think that is the key sauce here is my guess would be that um, Either they have a regular communication or they have someone on their staff that knows how to get they to do. their mm -hmm. entire families that those families pay attention when that person either emails or text blasts or phone blasts yeah, them or do. does all three. Sure. And we've got to figure out that framework for all schools mm -hmm. because I think that is how we get more engagement um, in that depth, uh, breadth and depth. So, God. I agree. Yes, I agree. Um, we've been having conversations and discussions about communication at the school level. There are some schools who do it very well and some who need improvement, and I think that's definitely the key. When our school-based people are having those conversations, it's always a little bit more successful than some of that larger district conversation we're trying to have. I agree 100%. Yeah, it went, <laughs> it went from North Pole to... <laughs> Another another direction. We'll just say that, uh, Dr. Bedard. I think that uh, concludes the superintendent's report. Correct? No. It does. <laughs> oh, there's one more item oh, actually. Wait a minute. Thank you, Miss Rachel. It? Oh, wait. No? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Miss Quinley. Yes. Um, in my well, in my in my binder, I have the board treasurer's report next, and so I think that's yeah. Um, so we're moving into the budget timeline, Ms. Quinley. Apologies. And I will quickly get through these. What we have here this evening is the beginning work of our budget work and the superintendent's... I'm sorry, yes, thank you. Let me get to the slides. The superintendent's primary um, parameters and goals within the budget are the first two slides, and you'll see... Um, dates that tell you our target for these and then some information around the activity. I'll draw attention just to a few. Um, important to know that today is the end of count period for January. So you know we've talked about this a lot, how important that is to a lot of things related to the budget. And so that second line there, um, Mr. Lang is working on our current projected enrollments by building by grade for next year. Really critical to us to begin the staffing conversations in our schools for next year. Down in the middle of the page on February 22nd, you see then we get the final of those numbers. So again, really focusing on the reliant, the necessary information uh, related to how many students we'll have and where they will be next year. At the very bottom of the page, you see mid-March is when the superintendent will make some determinations after we've seen requests about what the priorities are within the budget for next year for change. And on this page, on the very top one, uh, we've added in a slide so we don't lose track of the fact that March 24th is that date that the state legislature will make a determination as to whether or not they will accept and appropriate the ESSER funds. They, the federal law did change around that just last week after we had our last um, board meeting to where now they are obligated to accept two-thirds of that money by that date and the one-third they've got a little more time to consider. 
and then uh, you get down through that slide, you'll see April 28th, the budget workshop. That's a time we'll go deep into you into the details of what you're going to see us bring to you in next year's budget. Um, May 11th for public hearing, and then May 26th to bring you a document if we can get that done. It's going to be a heavy lift this year with Blueprint 20 implementation, some phase one in addition to our central office efficiency work. So we're saving, as is allowable by state statute, a June date in order to bring you that final document. The goals, we won't read all of those to you because um, there's not a lot of change, but let me just highlight some of the change. You will see that second bullet, plan for some sustainable reductions in order to meet that $16 million reduced revenue expectation we have next year uh, based on current revenues we have that will be moving to charter schools. And then beginning implementation of Blueprint 2030 Educational Visioning Phase 1, you see there in the fourth bullet. And the rest of these items are items we've been focusing on the last several years that remain priorities of the superintendent, with the exception of the last two, which is kind of a duplication, where we continue to use ESSER funds next year according to the rules and appropriate to the goals of the district. So these are just for your information um, where the superintendent is right now in the budget process, but we are happy to take some feedback or suggestions or questions. Questions? Doesn't look like it. Thank you, Ms. Quinley. Now we can go over. Oh, Mr. Abarca. Yeah, I, I, I just I think reiterate to the public who are listening that this is one of the most important things that we can do, right, is budget, the budget priorities that we set and we fund are determined in this process, right? So making sure that we understand all the things we just talked about and more um, must be set here. The priorities from the community standpoint must come out uh, at the public hearing, which we anticipate always not enough testimony, unfortunately, although it's been increasing throughout the years. Um, and it sounds like you guys have a new budget tool that you're going to be trying to play with for community input. So uh, is that true to, to form in this process this year? It is. Thank you for that reminder. Balancing Act that Ms. Wachel mentioned a moment ago that we'll be using through Blueprint 2030, we will also be um, implementing as a part of our budget planning tool. You'll see us probably use it around prioritizing some reductions, prioritizing some of those Blueprint 2030 vision um, enhancements for phase one as well. Well, you might as well keep the mic now. So we'll move into uh, the treasurer's report, Mr. Abarca. <laughs> uh, never. Uh, all right, good evening, everyone. Um, I'll try to get through this uh, relatively quickly. Um, so first looking at our summary slide, uh, important on this slide to note that the incidental and, incidental and teacher funds are operating budget. We have reached a point in the year where year-to-date revenues are greater than the expenditures. A reminder, again, we're going to mention this later, um, as we collect property taxes, we use our investment accounts to cover our cash flow um, through those times as we have spent down the actual revenues we've been, it received during this process right now. We're refilling the coffers thanks to our taxpayers paying on time, um, and um, we will then invest the extras to cover those times when we're not collecting revenue. So nevertheless, we are reached a critical moment where um, we are using those investments to cover our cost. Looking at uh, our local property taxes, um, our local revenue slide, my apologies, slide three, um, property taxes are at 49% of our budget. Uh, we have experienced a good collection rate so far this year. Um, and Linda, remind me the date for property tax collection, the deadline? They're due December 31st. Of the previous year, right? Correct. So we are late at this point. So please, for those who have not paid their property taxes yet, pay your property taxes so we can appropriately budget. Um, thank you. Um, looking at um, our continued local revenues, it just breaks out some of the line item um, uh, source codes there that we have. <clears throat> Looking at our federal revenues, uh, during December we claimed and received $3.7 million of our ESSER funds, seen on line 5423. Uh, I imagine if we get ESSER funds um, from the round three, that's where they'll go um, whenever we get them from the state legislature, fingers crossed. Um, looking at our revenue pie chart, um, again, this is a great um, summary of kind of the last few slides. Um, local revenues make up 74% of the total property budget, or the total budget. Local property taxes make up 60% of that total budget. Again, a lion's share of 
um, our revenue sources. So um, it is critical that we continue to maintain some level of those programs um, as others have sought to change that method of collection. Um, looking at um, slide eight here, <coughs> salaries and benefits, we are trailing behind a bit on salaries due to the inability to fill openings. Uh, our sub pay to teachers is well over budget due to a higher need to engage our own staff due to sub service shortage, uh, shortages. Um, look at our purchasing purchase services, uh, trailing well behind again, sub services line 6329 due to the lack of staffing available to our sub agencies. Um, obviously, as you all can see, we have some sub issues, some teacher issues that um, we need to um, to do everything we can to, to support our, our folks. Um, looking at our supplies, we are at 60% of our supplies um, expended to date and at 50% of the year. So it looks like we're a little over our supplies budget. Um, looking at our expenditures pie chart on slide 13, salary and benefits are at 63% of our total budgets. Um, finally, looking at our investment balances, uh, again, as we receive tax revenues, um, over our monthly cash flows, we make these investments to cover uh, when the revenues are not flowing in from taxes uh, and other line items of revenue. Uh, we see here the importance of some property tax revenues coming in during December and being placed in this investment account. So with that, Treasurer's report is done. Nicely done. Questions? <laughs> Ms. Quinley assumes none. All right, thank you, Mr. Abarca. All right, well, we'll move into the regular business items. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you know what? I'm sorry, Dr. Bedell. Let me do one other thing here super quickly. So I want to make it official because it is official that Ms. Candace Buckner, we can actually consider you a fully fledged and trained <laughs> board member <laughs> as of today, fully, well, you know what I meant. Uh, Certificate of Achievement from the Missouri School Board Association. Congratulations. All right, you'll get, uh, yeah, you'll get your letter soon. Um, we'll pass it over to you now, officially, Dr. Bedell. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. We have uh, two items that we're asking the board to take action on. Item number one is the Kansas City Teacher Residency Agreement. Uh, administration requests approval of the 2021-2022 agreement with KCTR to provide eight residents and 14 graduates to work in our schools. The cost of $122,500, um, $122,500 uh, cost of the program is available in the operating budget. Any questions? Mr. Chair, I will need to recuse myself from the vote today because I work for KCTR. <laughs> Got it, thank you. All right, uh, looks like there's no questions. Um, is there a motion to approve the recommendation of the superintendent of schools to approve the agreement with Kansas City Teacher Residency? So moved. Second. All right, June, will you please call the roll? Mr. Abarca? Yes. Ms. Cortez? Yes. Ms. Ford? Yes. Dr. Jones? Yes. Ms. Wolfsey? Yes. Mr. Hogan? Yes, the motion passes. Dr. Bedell? Thank you, Mr. Chair. The second item? is uh, Maddie Road Center Agreement Amendment. The administration requests approval of an amendment to remove one position under the agreement due to staffing availability. The net savings of $73,438 uh, from our VOCA grant will be reallocated for other purposes. So I will have to abstain on this one because my wife serves on the board of Maddie Roads. Any questions? Ms. Wolfsey. I just had a question about why we were not using that person anymore, or? Thank you. Any other questions? All right, June, will you please call the roll? Let's do that first. Um, is second. there a second? Second. Let me, let me actually read the motion, though. Um, is there a motion to approve the First Amendment to the Maddie Road Service Agreement by removing the roaming therapist position from the scope of services included in the salary, cell phone, mileage reimbursement, fringe benefits, equipment, and administrative fees associated with the position? Second. All right, Jimmy, call the roll. Mr. Barca? Yes. Ms. Buckner? Yes. Ms. Cortez? Yes. Ms. Ford? Yes. Dr. Jones? Yes. Ms. Wolfsey? Yes. The motion passes. All right, Dr. Bedell? All right, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Um, all right, any questions? 
All right, we will um, ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All right, June, will you call the roll? Mr. Barca? Yes. Ms. Buckner? Yes. Ms. Cortez? Yes. Ms. Ford? Yes. Dr. Jones? Yes. Ms. Wolfsey? Yes. Mr. Hogan? Yes, the motion passes. And June, will you do a quick review of the action items from tonight? first item is to add the Blueprint 2030 um, slide deck that um, Dr. Collier was talking about to the website as well as to the assembly agenda. Um, the second one is um, the board would like to accompany, accompany pardon me, um, the, to the trips like to DC regarding Blueprint in action. Um, the third one I have is Mr. Hogan wants the data trends on the stu student summits and other items. I have listened to the video to make sure I have that correctly. Got it. And then the last one I have is a list of the community meetings. Ms. Hoytel, I believe that this was what you were discussing, provide a listing for the board to look at the dates and choose the meetings for these community outreach that they would like to attend. June, can I add something to that? Can that just, can that form or whatever it is in a, in a real-time thing just be linked on our Friday update so we can see what meetings are coming up? That would probably be the easiest way for us to visually know if we could, and then we could let June know or you whatever. All right, then we are officially adjourned. Thank you.